Disclaimer! This video contains spoilers for these Transformers titles. There are time codes in the description if you want to jump around. All set? Alright, now let's just jump into it. We now return to the Transformers. Across the first decade of the 2000s, Transformers went through not one, not two, not three, but four subsequent reboots. Then you have the debut of the IDW comic run in 2005, all of which amounted to a diverse but constantly changing franchise. However, following the financial success of the first two Transformers movies, Hasbro wanted to simplify and unify their approach to Transformers going forward. They wanted a single continuity that would become the definitive new version of the Transformers for the 2010s. As such, HasLab was created, headed by Rick Alvarez with cooperation from Aaron Archer. It was a division that set out with the express goal of generating an outline, concept art, and ideas that would fuel Transformers for the next decade. It would center the TV shows, video games, and even some comics into one unified new vision for the franchise. It was a bold prospect, but with the dramatically increased popularity of the franchise, Hasbro saw fit to create a Transformer that was consistent and accessible to all fans, new and old, starting with a TV show set to debut in 2010. In fact, really the only part of the brand that wasn't going to be under this umbrella was the live-action movies. They would continue to do their own thing, with the third movie getting underway. In fact, before Revenge of the Fallen even came out, Paramount set the release date for Transformers 3 for July 2011, although Michael Bay immediately retaliated, saying he agreed to July 2012, wanting to take a break from giant robots for a little while. Though despite the potentially longer wait for the third blockbuster film, there was still a healthy dose of Transformers stuff for fans to enjoy, including an all-new DLC for the Revenge of the Fallen video game, introducing a handful of new playable characters like Sideswipe, Soundwave, Jetfire, and even Jazz from the first movie, as well as G1 skins for Megatron, Starscream, and Optimus Prime. It even added three new multiplayer maps for Transformers fans to battle it out on. on top of that, in the aftermath of the movie's release, interviews and press with many of the actors, writers, and director Michael Bay continued, talking about the movie both from its critical reception to financial. Perhaps most infamously is Megan Fox speaking out about Michael Bay's onset persona, comparing him to Hitler, which caused a bit of a stir online, to which even some of the crew were upset by the remarks. But Michael Bay didn't really seem to mind, even expressing that he looked forward to more crazy comments on Transformers 3. And official word finally came through through regarding Transformers 3, as on October 1st, after a few months of stewing, Michael Bay officially signed on to direct the film for a July 2011 release. Another two years and Transformers would be back on the big screen for a third adventure. Although this time, writers Alex Kurtzman and Roberto Orsi decided not to pen the third installment, instead leaving Revenge of the Fallen co-writer Aaron Kruger's sole responsibility for Transformers 3's script. Surely an interesting change, and with no writer strike on the horizon, perhaps Transformers 3 could redeem the critical failings of Transformers 2 to bring about a satisfying trilogy conclusion. Eventually, after Revenge of the Fallen's box office run came to a close, the film released on DVD and Blu-ray on October 20th, four months after its theatrical debut, where it would continue to be a success, selling two million copies in its first 24 hours. And like the first movie, you could also purchase a two-disc special edition, which came with an entire two-hour documentary chronicling the making of the movie. From the struggles of the writer's strike to the global and explosive production, which also chronicled the creation of the biggest on-screen explosion for the end of the movie, showing just how impressive the feat really was. But the most interesting section most definitely comes from the undertaking of visual effects by ILM and Digital Domain. From the destruction of an aircraft carrier to dealing Optimus Prime an impressive amount of damage during the forest fight, and of course, the creation of Devastator. A creature so large it could destroy even the most powerful of ILM's hardware. But now, as the press revolving around Revenge of the Fallen died down and news regarding Transformers 3 was few and far between, Transformers fans were looking for something to keep their attention without a TV show on the air, which led to the perfect timing for the announcement of an all-new Transformers video game called War for Cybertron. Developed by High Moon Studios and set to be the kicking off point for Hasbro's new unified continuity. With a quick teaser released at the tail end 
of 2009, the game promised a very G1-esque look and approach to a Cybertron-based story that had never been seen before. Fans were immediately interested in a far more faithful approach to Transformers, as well as the promised deep dive into the war on Cybertron. And following this teaser, the marketing push really kicked off in the early months of... On January 12th, Activision released the first full trailer for War for Cybertron. Expanding on December's teaser, it shows Optimus Prime, Megatron, and many other Autobots and Decepticons in their full Cybertronian glory in a massive CG-rendered war zone. While it didn't show any gameplay, the visuals were incredibly enticing to Transformers fans. I mean, the thing caps off with Omega Supreme and Trypticon. Like, dude, that's just awesome. While Transformers had dipped its toe into the video game world before, fans were still waiting for the quintessential Transformers game to really sink their teeth into. And so far, by the looks of it, War for Cybertron could be that exact game once it hit shelves in June of 2010. Meanwhile, Revenge of the Fallen was still being lambasted even months after its release, as it was nominated for seven Razzie Awards in February, and only one Oscar for sound mixing compared to the first film's three Oscar noms. Once again, Transformers came up empty on Oscar night, but had its hands full after the Razzies, having won three of its nominated awards for Worst Picture, Worst Director, and Worst Screenplay, a prestigious award that each of the writers humorously thanked them for. You gotta take it in stride, you know? Despite the continuing critical rampage against Revenge of the Fallen, Transformers 3 got underway with no time to waste, as location scouting had begun across the USA, particularly in Chicago. On top of that, in the wake of the immense success of James Cameron's Avatar, considerations were being made for Transformers 3 to potentially be released in 3D. 3D was the hottest new commodity in Hollywood. Everyone and their mother was converting their movies to try and capitalize on Avatar's success, so of course Paramount would try and bring Transformers 3 into the equation. All the while, news finally started coming through regarding the next Transformers TV show, a show that would debut on an all-new network created by Hasbro and Discovery, eventually named the Hub. The next show, now named Transformers Prime, would be the network's flagship franchise when it debuted in the fall of 2010. And it would see Alex Kurtzman and Roberta Orsi re-team with the franchise alongside Jeff Klein to develop the show as Hasbro's new definitive approach for the future. And Hasbro wasn't sparing any expense on the show, as it was set to feature 3D computer animation, which would be the first time any Transformers series was wholly 3D animated since Beast Machines ended in 2000. An exciting idea idea to plenty of fans. Eventually, War for Cybertron returned to the conversation with an all-new gameplay trailer released in February. Over 90 seconds, the look of the game was revealed, as well as glimpses of its third-person shooter feel, all promising that this was going to be a must-have game for all Transformers fans. <laughs> This was followed up by a three-minute behind-the-scenes video where the lead developers and even game director Matt Teager revealed their inspirations for the design of the game, both in terms of gameplay but also the world of Cybertron. Not only taking inspirations from Generation 1, but also Tron and Blade Runner to create a truly unique take on the Transformer homeworld. It wasn't long after that that the multiplayer side of the game was given the spotlight, with an all-new look released in April. Not only did it show off some maps and massive battles, but it sold the incredibly exciting concept of creating and customizing your own Transformers character to battle alongside or against your friends. Later trailers even gave hints towards the different game modes that would be playable in multiplayer, proving that the war between Autobots and Decepticons could be played in multiple different ways. Everything regarding War for Cyber was positioning it as the Transformers event of the year, and with it officially given the release date of June 22nd, the clock was ticking for the game Transformers fans had been waiting for. All the while, development continued on Transformers 3, with confirmation of returning cast members as well as reports of additional cast members joining the third installment, starting with a red Ferrari as the latest Autobot, as well as new human additions Francis McDormand, John Malkovich, and Ken Jeong, later followed by Patrick Dempsey and 
and Alan Tudyk. At the same time, the debate continued over whether or not Transformers 3 would be in 3D. It seemed that in conversation with James Cameron, Michael Bay came to the inclusion that post-converting the movie, like so many other blockbusters were doing, wasn't going to work out. And James Cameron held the position that post-converting would do nothing but damage 3D's reputation. However, despite these concerns, Transformers 3 was officially announced to be in 3D. Just native 3D. Michael Bay was going to use 3D cameras to capture as much live 3D footage as possible. These movies have always been visually impressive, so Transformers 3 being in native 3D was an immediately interesting idea. More good news came after that as Michael Bay confirmed that the twins would not return for Transformers 3. Oh wait, nope. Set photos of them got out the literal day after he said that, so maybe they are back? They won't be the only returning characters though, as several photos were starting to eke out revealing the Transformers vehicles getting ready for the imminent start to Transformers 3's production. Although it wasn't all smooth sailing, as eventually Megan Fox was fired from the production. Yeah, no, she's gone now. A shock to plenty of fans to be sure, but it did kind of come off the back of the series of comments from the tail end of 2009. In any case, production moved very quickly to find a replacement. And I mean very quickly. Within two weeks of the firing of Megan Fox, Rosie Huntington Whitley was cast as the new female lead, Carly, who, if you remember, was Spike Witwicky's girlfriend and eventual wife from the G1 cartoon. Despite the sudden change in leads though, production on Transformers 3 was now officially underway in Los Angeles for the first six weeks of the planned four and a half month shoot. With that came a blitz of information, confirming that Michael Bay planned for Transformers 3 to bring the trilogy to a resounding conclusion, whilst also tackling a new main villain with Shockwave. That's right, the one-eyed Decepticon scientist will be the main threat for the Autobots in Transformers 3. At the same time, in the first official press release for the upcoming series Transformers Prime, Hasbro confirmed that Peter Cullen would voice Optimus Prime and Frank Welker would voice Megatron. Ah, finally, the two original voice actors for Optimus and Megatron were back on TV, and they joined franchise newcomer Jeffrey Combs, who was already confirmed to voice Ratchet. And eventually, the excitement building around Transformers War for Cybertron reached its crescendo, with more trailers releasing in the lead-up to its June 22nd release. There were even pre-order deals where, depending on where you pre-ordered the game, you could get a bonus character such as Demolisher, Jazz, or the most marketed of them all, Shockwave. You got the touch! You got the Why this song? When your hit percentage exceeds mine, you may choose the soundtrack. Eventually all led to June 22nd, where after a myriad of trailers and interviews, after a small army of characters were announced to join the cast, Transformers War for Cybertron finally hit store shelves. It was now time to jump into the game that fans had waited 25 years to play. War for Cybertron chronicles the history of the Transformers like no other piece of the franchise had done on screen before. From the first interactions between Megatron and Starscream to the devastation wrought by the Decepticons' quest for power. With tons of references and callbacks, the game was an immediately welcome addition to Transformers. Hell, it even kicks off with Steve Blum doing his best Victor Caroli impression for the opening narration on each mission. Many millions of years ago, on the planet Cybertron, Life existed. Civil war has ravaged Cybertron, homeworld to the Transformers for millions of years. While the game is technically split across both a Decepticon and Autobot campaign, and you can start with either, it does tell one unified story where the Decepticon campaign comes first. The first five levels of the game see Megatron gain control of a mysterious and unstable substance known as Dark Energon, which is under the control of Starscream. Impossible! No one has ever survived to reach this place! You shall soon learn, Starscream. I decide what is possible and what isn't. 
And after finally acquiring Dark Energon, Megatron's quest for power leads him to facing off against Autobot leader Zeta Prime, defeating him and sparking a quest to reach the core of Cybertron via use of the Omega Key. It's a massive side to the story, showing how the Decepticons crush the Autobots beneath their feet, removing all hope via the seeming death of Zeta Prime. But as much pain as it might bring to crush the Autobots, the third-person gameplay is a lot of fun. The campaigns and entire goal is to make the player feel powerful, which it succeeds at in spades. And in one of the campaign's more inventive aspects, you can play through the game alone or with two friends taking on the other two characters, fighting enemies side by side. The Decepticon half allows you to play as Megatron, Brawl, Barricade, Starscream, Thundercracker, Skywarp, Soundwave, and Breakdown, all in the quest for power. Or in Starscream's case, showing just how the treacherous Sky Commander became Megatron second in command, although not without some hiccups here and there. To all Decepticons who fight for the glory of Cybertron, Megatron has fallen. I, Starscream, have taken my rightful place as your leader! Starscream, you halfwit! I still function! A fact you shall regret when I choke the life out of you! Eventually, this half leads to a massive showdown against the Autobot superweapon Omega Supreme, a massive boss fight that shows off some immense scale. The dude's just really big. But upon defeating Omega Supreme, Megatron is left with the ability to journey to the core of Cybertron, left to poison it with Dark Energon, ensuring his reign over the entire planet, all but securing victory for the Decepticons, which dovetails right into the Autobot campaign. It is here that Optimus and the Autobots are on the back foot, trying to regroup after the loss of Zeta Prime. And eventually, during this half, Optimus takes on the responsibility of leader and eventually succeeds Zeta to become Optimus Prime. From here, the Autobot campaign allows you to play as Optimus, Bumblebee, Ratchet, Sideswipe, Warpath, Ironhide, Air Raid, Silverbolt, and Jetfire. From missions surrounding the reactivation of Autobot defenses in their capital city of Iacon, to infiltrating the Chaos prison complex, the Decepticon's maximum security prison, and eventually journeying down to the core of Cybertron to purge it of Megatron's poison. It's another expansive adventure that not only breaks new ground for Transformers stories, but also brings out a ton of fun references and nods to even the earliest days of the franchise. Wow, weep, Ragna, weep, ninny bomb. What was that? That's the universal greeting. I don't think it worked! Eventually, however, the Autobots discover that the core of Cybertron is beyond saving. As such, the core itself speaks to Optimus, bestowing upon him the Matrix of Leadership. With it, Optimus will lead the Autobots away from Cybertron in search of a new home. Although Megatron doesn't want the Autobots to leave, deploying his ultimate weapon to destroy any transports attempting to escape, which leads to air raids, Silverbolt, and Jetfire to infiltrate the weapon and and disable it, all of which only leads to the reveal that the weapon itself is a Transformer, none other than Trypticon, who crashes down on the surface, leading the Autobot campaign to culminate in a massive showdown against the Titan. Once again, mirroring the finale of the Decepticon side, the Autobot campaign ends with a show of massive scale. Eventually, however, through an exceedingly difficult mission, Trypticon is defeated, leaving the Autobots no further opposition in leaving Cybertron. Optimus, Megatron is still out there. And as long as we remain here, we shall resist him. But in time, our turn will come to leave Cybertron as well. I have commissioned a new galactic transport for us, an Ark, in which we shall make our journey through the stars. No matter where we go, Cybertron will be with us. And that concludes the campaign for War for Cybertron. While not the longest game ever, it certainly provided tons and tons of nods towards fans, as well as providing a generally fun and entertaining gameplay experience. Hell, even the end credits set to Till All Are One by Stan Bush features tons of little Transformers nods, with several homages to the original G1 commercial bumpers, which is fun. Overall, War for Cybertron was given positive reviews. While some criticized its repetitive visuals and level design, 
design, it was by and large the best Transformers game yet, and one that fans could sink their teeth into for quite some time. This was mainly thanks to the multiplayer side of the game. While the customization options weren't super expansive, the concept of creating your own Transformer was still enjoyed by plenty of fans, allowing them to fight in Transformer battles like no other. And thanks to the variety of game modes, War for Cybertron was sure to survive for years to come. At the same time, a companion novel written by Alex Irvine was released, titled Transformers Exodus, which detailed a very similar origin story just in written form, all of which served as the basis for what was now being called the Aligned Continuity, so named because that was the word that Hasbro consistently used to describe this new long-term approach. Now, with War for Cybertron in store shelves and Transformers fans keeping occupied with its many multiplayer arenas, with even word of a DLC pack on the way, news continued to flow from Transformers 3, which in July moved from Los Angeles to the Milwaukee Art Museum for a few days, all before moving down to Chicago for the largest chunk of production. Which, after the highly secretive shooting done in LA, the Chicago sets were a nice change of pace. As the crews were filming in broad daylight in the middle of downtown, tons and tons of images got out, from new and familiar vehicles to even a reveal that Optimus Prime would have a trailer this time around. But the Transformer vehicles weren't the only exciting sight as the people of Chicago got to see several skydiving stunts from buildings and helicopters through the streets of the city. But even that was only the tip of the iceberg, as the citizens of Chicago were able to bear witness to their city being destroyed, with carnage and bayhem ravaging the city streets. If you were in Chicago in the summer of 2010, you saw a whole new kind of fireworks. Explosions were set off across the city streets and even on top of some of the skyscrapers. It all proved that Transformers 3 was going to be even bigger than what the franchise had done before. After nearly two months of bayhem and carnage though, production eventually left Chicago and journeyed to Detroit for more destruction. Production later went to Kennedy Space Center in Florida and capped things off in Washington DC where Bumblebee had a little accident. Now, the Transformers movies are known for car chases, but what movie fans saw out here this afternoon was a lot more than they had bargained for. <laughs> Classic. Bumblebee's dead. Despite that little accident, filming in Washington wasn't halted too much as it continued pretty soundly into night shoots with explosions across the city. But the most interesting location for the production was the aforementioned Kennedy Space Center. There had been plenty of speculation that the movie would center around a space race plot of sorts, so filming with NASA at the Space Center kind of just confirmed that suspicion. Which all eventually led to the reveal of the third film's title, confirmed to be called Transformers. Dark of the Moon. Honestly, this might be my favorite title thus far. I mean, it just sounds like dumb, pulpy fun. And maybe that's what the franchise needs after the critically panned Revenge of the Fallen. Eventually, following this reveal, production on Dark of the Moon reached its conclusion in November 2010. As such, news coming from the threequel became few and far between as it headed into purely post-production. All fans could do was speculate on when they'd get the first official look at the third installment. In the meantime, fans of War for Cybertron got two new DLC packs with a smattering of new characters for multiplayer, including Onslaught, Scattershot, Shockwave, Jazz, and Demolisher in the first pack, alongside Dead End and Zeta Prime in the second pack. At the same time, Transformers fans were soon able to return to TV screens for perhaps the most expensive Transformers series yet, Transformers Prime. Having debuted some teases during Comic-Con and having revealed the cast of characters set to take the stage, the unusual the usual veil of secrecy was slowly being taken away, with fans getting new hints and details as the fall months continued. Eventually, it led to the first teaser for the show at the tail end of October 2010. Megatron has not been seen nor heard from in some time, but if his return is imminent, as I fear. It could be catastrophic. With groundbreaking computer animation, Transformers Prime promised to be a spectacle unlike anything Transformers had done on TV. In fact, the goal was set out to make live action quality animation every week. Because of that, Transformers Prime was immediately the center of the animated pop culture conversation. Of course, the reveals of the designs caused plenty of commotion among diehard G1 fans, yada yada, we've seen that cycle before. But this was a pretty big deal in the cartoon world. And 
and Transformers fans are pretty excited. Although figuring out when the first episode would air was a tad bit complicated. Airing on The Hub, the show would kick off with a five-part miniseries event, which was either set to begin on November 26th, according to the press release, or November 29th, according to the teaser. The Hub's scheduling could be seen as confusing at best or downright incompetent at worst. It was difficult to make heads or tails of when episodes would air, and it was also unclear when the rest of the show would continue after the five-part miniseries was done, although eventually it was confirmed that the rest of the season would kick off in February 2011. Though that's also a confusing choice, as any momentum the miniseries generated would be long gone by the time February rolled around. But oh well, scheduling confusion aside, the show looked fairly solid, and as marketing continued over the month of November, fans got further glimpses of characters, action, and the story the miniseries was set to tell. And eventually, all led to November 26th, or November 29th, where Transformers Prime finally made its debut on TV screens with the five-part miniseries premiere titled Darkness Rising. It's been three years since the last appearance of the Decepticons, yet still, in the present day, the Autobots, working in secret on Earth, monitor the planet for their inevitable return. Featuring a much smaller cast of characters than Transformers Animated, yet bolstering perhaps the most impressive stable of voice actors for a Transformers show yet. You have Optimus Prime, steadfast leader voiced by Peter Cullen, Ratchet, cranky old doctor voiced by Jeffrey Combs, Bulkhead, lovable John Giant voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson, Bumblebee, the young and eager scout who can't talk, RC, the tough and reserved bot voiced by Sumali Montano, and Cliffjumper, a warrior who exudes confidence, voiced by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I did not make that up. Cliffjumper immediately kicks off the premiere with a major action sequence as he is the first to learn of the Decepticon's return. A return that deals him a great deal of punishment, all leading to a meeting with Starscream. Scream. It's been a while. <coughs> so, where's your master? Never mind him. I am my own master. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, so that's how they were able to afford Dwayne Johnson. Because Cliffjumper's dead now. Killed by the ever-treacherous Starscream, voiced by Steve Blum, who's joined by the silently menacing Soundwave, who doesn't say a word. It's actually kind of creepy. So now, the remaining five Autobots, joined by main human trio Jack, Miko, and Raphael, or Raph, along with Special Agent William Fowler, voiced by Ernie Hudson, must fend off the Decepticons and defend the Earth. Each member of the human trio gets their own Autobot partner, Jack, the Straight Man gets paired with the no-nonsense RC. Miko, who loves destruction and carnage, gets partnered with walking wrecking ball Bulkhead. And Raph, the young computer wizard, is paired with the mute Bumblebee. Though in a fun twist of fate, Raph can understand him. It wants us to get in. No, just me. How do you know that? It said so. What? But it's not all fun and games, because if the Decepticons are truly back and hunting for Energon as Cliffjumper discovered, then they're most definitely preparing for the return of Megatron. Decepticons! I have returned. From here, the five-part premiere centers on the mysterious substance known as Dark Energon, which also featured heavily in the War for Cybertron video game. Here, it is also given the nickname the Blood of Unicron, and it has the power to reanimate the dead. While at first they're mindless zombies, once Megatron infuses himself with Dark Energon, he has the ability to control them. It's as if the blood of Unicron, the Destroyer, flows through my veins, as if I hear his very thoughts. 
leading to a five-episode arc where Optimus Prime and the Autobots are left to fight off against Megatron's attempts to bring forth a terrifying undead army. At first bringing through only a squadron, which proves to be a lot for Optimus and Ratchet to handle, but then he ups the ante for the main event. Megatron plans to use Dark Energon to reanimate all of the dead warriors of Cybertron, and via use of a space bridge, transport them to Earth to destroy everything in his wake. And ultimately, all builds to the fifth part of this premiere, where the Autobots are left to fend off the Decepticons and stop the space bridge before Megatron's undead army can come through. I hold no illusions about engaging your army, Megatron. But I might derail its objective by removing its head. <laughs> Highly unlikely, Optimus as I am infused with their very might! Thanks to the 3D animation, the action sequences here are able to come to life in ways that Transformers has never been able to outside of the movies. The robots are fast, energetic, and acrobatic, leading to some of the coolest set pieces in the franchise. But in the end, with the help of the humans, the Autobots manage to overload the space bridge and make a quick exit before it ultimately explodes, incinerating everything in its wake, including Megatron. Decepticons, it is with deep sorrow that I note for the log, Megatron's spark has been extinguished. All hail Starscream. And with that, this five-part premiere comes to a close. While the Decepticons have been dealt a severe blow, Starscream will surely try to retaliate in one way or another. But for now, the Autobots, alongside their new human friends, are set to defend the Earth no matter the cost. Transformers Prime got off to a solid start. It was an exciting and big-scaled new approach to the franchise that was quickly winning over even some of the more critical fans. But now it was on hiatus until the main season would debut in February. As such, all that was left for Transformers fans before the year came to a close was the first footage from Transformers Dark of the Moon. Set to debut in front of the latest Chronicles of Narnia film and Tron Legacy, audiences finally got to see the first official look at Dark of the Moon as the teaser trailer released on December 8th, 2010. And this is a teaser in every sense of the word, in a weird similarity to the first movie's teaser trailer which showed a supposedly failed Mars rover mission, this trailer focuses on the Apollo 11 moon landing in 1969, although this posits that there was more to the mission than we were led to believe. Neil, you are dark on the rock. Mission is a go. They have 21 minutes. That's right, a crashed Cybertronian ship somehow found its way to the moon. Is it Autobot? Is it Decepticon? That much remains unknown, but it does firmly set up a new mystery for the third installment. We are not alone after all, are we? No, sir. We are not alone. Right at the end, the trailer turns its focus on this unidentified robot all before zooming into his eye and revealing the Transformers Dark of the Moon title card. Speculation ran rampant about the identity of this character. Could it be Alpha Trion? Could it be the rumored Sentinel Prime or Ultra Magnus? Time would have to tell, as always. But now, fans had seen their first glimpse of Dark of the Moon, but the lack of any real footage was a bit disappointing. Let's see some robot action, come on! Audiences would have to wait for that, unfortunately, but not for too long, as the marketing campaign for Dark of the Moon would continue in the early months of... Kicking off with the Super Bowl, Dark of the Moon was set to make its presence known with 30 seconds of all new footage. Before that, though, Chevy released their own ad just before the Super Bowl, featuring a humorous tie-in to Transformers 3. <laughs> But finally, as promised, on the night of the game, a 30-second TV spot was aired, giving fans a much better look at the upcoming third installment.
set to an unnerving alert sound, the Dark of the Moon Super Bowl spot showed some actual footage from the movie. With glimpses of action, the devastation in Chicago, and ending on a sequence where Optimus Prime lays waste to Decepticons? I mean, come on, sign me up. Am I a glutton for punishment after Revenge of the Fallen? Maybe, but this looks sweet. And it was later followed up by a very similar NASCAR spot two weeks later. While most of the spot was the same, the music was different and the new teaser showed more vehicle action, alongside glimpses of the upgraded NASCAR Autobot seen on the streets of Chicago the previous summer. And as the months continued, the identity of the mysterious robot from the teaser was finally confirmed as Sentinel Prime, which was corroborated by an Empire Magazine special that revealed Sentinel in all his CGI glory beside Optimus Prime. At the same time, Activision announced their latest partnership with High Moon Studios, the Dark of the Moon tie-in video game, which released its own teaser trailer to get the word out. With the same developers behind War for Cybertron tackling the Dark of the Moon game, signs pointed to the notion that this might be the best movie tie-in game yet. But despite news flowing steadily from Dark of the Moon, there was still a long way to go before the July 1st debut. As such, fans finally returned to TV screens as Transformers Prime began its regular weekly episodes for the next chunk of Season 1. Starting on February 11th with the 6th episode, Transformers Prime was back, with an all-new intro to boot. Following the five-part premiere, Transformers Prime would scale back a little bit, instead focusing on more episodic stories as the Autobots faced off against Starscream and the Decepticons in still impressive 3D animation. Introducing new concepts like Scraplets, these little Cybertronian bugs that eat anything metal, especially living metal, which is pretty terrifying for the Autobots. Then there's Mech, a human villain organization led by Silas, who is voiced by Clancy Brown, and they're obsessed with being on the front lines of technological innovation, specifically in terms of military firepower. So it's no stretch to say that once they discover the existence of the Transformers, they're immediately hooked to try and replicate their power. The show also introduces some new characters, like Wheeljack, who in a departure from his G1 scientist counterpart, this version of the character is a Wrecker, a fierce warrior who's best friends with Bulkhead. It's a new take on the character that is a genuinely welcome addition. Though his reunion with Bulkhead isn't the smoothest, as the Decepticons end up replacing him with a clone in order to locate the Autobot base. But once the real Wheeljack breaks free, that whole plan ends up backfiring right in Starscream's face, which is pretty fun. The show also introduces Skyquake, a new Decepticon warrior that Starscream tries to bring under his command in order to inspire the troops. But then Optimus and Bumblebee kill the guy, so... That doesn't work out. But while Wheeljack and Skyquake don't become regular cast members, there are two new Decepticons who do take on regular roles. First is Breakdown, direct rival to Bulkhead. And second is the show's best character, Knockout, voiced by Darren Norris. This sly Decepticon is obsessed with his looks, most notably his shiny paint job, making him an immediate fun addition. I like the way I look in steel-belted radials. But both of these characters are here in service of the overarching serialized plot, where following the destruction of the space bridge, it turns out that Megatron actually survived, thanks to the miracles of Dark Energon. While he remains unconscious for the time being, Knockout and Breakdown are tasked with bringing their leader back to his former glory. Oh boy, Megatron's gonna come back! Well, not immediately. Plenty of episodes pass where his condition doesn't improve one bit, but every passing week fans would ask, is this the one where he comes back? Nope, that's a racing episode where Bumblebee takes on Knockout. Is it this one? Nope, that one sees RC and Jack wandering a forest. But they do encounter former Decepticon Arachnid, voiced by Gina Torres. She is the direct rival to RC, given that back on Cybertron she murdered RC's partner Tailgate, a move that's very similar to Cliff Jumper's death from the premiere, who was also RC's partner. I mean, maybe giving RC two dead partners is a little much, but a direct rivalry like this mines a lot of good conflict, so. 
But it's after this that things start getting real, starting with the episode Sick Mind, in which Optimus Prime is infected with the Cybonic Plague, a Decepticon manufactured bioweapon used during the war on Cybertron. As such, RC and Bumblebee must sneak on board the Decepticon warship to find the cure. But in all their searches, they come up empty. There's no record of a cure in the Decepticon database. But there is something far more horrifying. Megatron. He's alive. What? That's not possible. But you want to know the real kicker? The discovery of a still functional Megatron may be exactly what the Autobots need, because he's the one who manufactured the plague, so we must know a cure. As such, via use of the cortical psychic patch, Bumblebee enters Megatron's mind. Now this is good stuff. You get an actual look at what goes on inside of his head. Spoiler alert, it's just him endlessly killing Optimus Prime. Though that comes to an end once Megatron actually becomes self-aware of his current predicament. Eventually, however, Bumblebee is able to retrieve the cure, swiftly exiting Megatron's mind just before the Decepticons catch them as they make their escape. As such, Optimus is cured and ready to make a full recovery. But weirdly enough, Knockout notices that Megatron no longer has any brainwave activity. His mind was working overtime before, so where did it go? The cortical psychic patch was a two-way street. Megatron is now in control of Bumblebee's body. And with it, he locates another shard of Dark Energon, hell-bent on restoring his former glory. And this leads to the big moment fans have been waiting for. While Optimus, Bulkhead, and RC are occupied with yet another Starscream plot, Ratchet and Raphael are left to fend off Bumblebee as he uses cortical psychic patch and the Dark Energon shard to revive Megatron. Decepticons, your rightful lord and master has returned. And just like his animated counterpart, he immediately goes after Starscream. I mean, he doesn't kill Starscream like he did there, but he does beat the scrap out of him. But Starscream retaliates in the following episode, infusing himself with Dark Energon temporarily, all in an effort to reawaken Skyquake so that he might retake control of the Decepticons once again. Though things don't quite go to plan, as instead, Skyquake, as well as Jack, Miko, and Raph are inadvertently trapped in a parallel dimension dubbed the Shadow Zone. It's actually a pretty fun episode, where the kids have to deal with the zombie Skyquake all on their own, while the Autobots try their best to get them back to the correct dimension unharmed. Ratchet, can we triangulate the geographical position of the cell phone signal? In a parallel dimensional plane? Let's find out. But following that episode, Transformers Prime entered another brief hiatus. I guess making a show with this much intensive 3D animation, they gotta take some breaks every now and again. But despite that, this show was proving itself as one of the best entries to Transformers. The darker tone, the more mature setting, the good characters, all of it was easily winning over fans. Meanwhile, across the spring of 2011, news was coming through thick and fast regarding other aspects of Transformers, with Alex Irvine announcing a sequel to his Exodus novel, this time titled Exiles, which would pick up after the first book's events. An all-new show for preschool kids was announced titled Rescue Bots, and Transformers Prime was confirmed to get a second season. All the while, press was building for the highly anticipated release of Transformers Dark of the Moon. Kicking off in March with an all-new look at the Dark of the Moon game, revealing gameplay and visuals very similar to the War for Cybertron game, but with some of the best looks yet at the robots set to appear in the third 
third movie, even including the non-movie edition of Warpath. On top of that, in pretty substantial news, it was confirmed that Leonard Nimoy would join the cast to voice Sentinel Prime. This would mark the second time the actor had had a role in Transformers, having originally played Galvatron in the 1986 movie. Leonard Nimoy was most certainly a welcome addition to Dark of the Moon, and fans were excited to hear his voice bring Sentinel Prime to life. Not long after that, across the month of April, official images began popping up, all in lead up to an all new trailer set to debut before Fast Five and Thor. Finally, after mere teases having been released so far, there was going to be something big for fans to sink their teeth into, as on April 28th, the full theatrical trailer was released for Dark of the Moon. Our entire space race of the 1960s was in response to an event. In two and a half minutes, this trailer shows off a far darker tone than either of the previous movies, all the while showing off the immense spectacle of the action and set pieces. The visual effects look spectacular. The footage of Chicago being destroyed with Autobots and Decepticons fighting in the streets was truly awesome to behold. <laughs> The trailer even ends with this giant snake thing tearing down the top half of a skyscraper. Man, July 1st is like forever away, I gotta see this now. Now, people were a little burned by Revenge of the Fallen, but given that pretty much everyone involved in that movie, including Michael Bay, said that that one kinda sucked, perhaps lessons were learned. Maybe, just maybe. Dark of the Moon can pull through. As such, with the release of the trailer, the final marketing push was kicked into high gear, as promotion for the film built up in the lead up to its release. From this poster, to this theater standee, to even a $25,000 bounty if someone could spot the twins in the film, given that they were allegedly removed save for a blink and you miss it cameo. Eventually, a slightly different edit of the theatrical trailer was released, premiering before Pirates of the Caribbean 4. While almost identical to the prior trailer, it it did feature some new footage, and if you saw it in theaters, you would get to see it in 3D, showcasing the work Michael Bay and the team did to make 3D worthwhile this time around. But during this final marketing push, there was a rather bizarre occurrence. You see, like the first two movies, this one was going to be joined by a comic and novel adaptation, following nearly the same events as the finished movie. The only problem? This time around, plenty of pages from the comic adaptation were leaked online. Pages that included major plot spoilers. Even fans who weren't super concerned with spoilers were telling others to stay away, as it ruined many of the film's major beats. On the plus side, most audiences would never get a glimpse of these spoilers. Spoilers. Instead, they were swept up in the continuing marketing campaign. Once again, general audiences were ready to jump back into theaters for more Bayham. In fact, the movie was set to debut two days early. Instead of the original planned release of July 1st, the movie was going to release on June 29th. A whole 48 hours early? Dude, I'm there. And at the same time, Transformers Prime capitalized on the increasing publicity in the month of June with two all-new episodes, each featuring a dire encounter with the villain organization Mech. First, Mech managed to capture the Decepticon Breakdown, breaking him down for any information they could find, all before Breakdown's rival Bulkhead decides to break him out. Following that, Arachnid ends up joining forces with Mech to get back at Jack and RC. While Mech doesn't make away with anything vital here, Jack mother, June, does end up getting introduced to the Transformers in a rather traumatizing way. But ultimately, she ends up becoming the latest addition to the small club of people who know about the Transformers. And it's nice, you know? Seeing the expansion of the human cast like this is fun. But while Transformers Prime trucked along fairly well, the network it was hosted on, The Hub, wasn't faring as well. Despite the variety in programming for audiences, viewership was much lower than anticipated, which was no doubt making Hasbro and Discovery bleed money from this cooperative enterprise. Things weren't looking great so far, which was unfortunate. Despite that, Transformers was still at the center of the pop culture conversation, as an onslaught of TV 
spots, posters, and clips were released in the lead-up to Dark of the Moon's release, all of which continued to sell the massive Chicago set pieces, which included a look at the Birdmen, the wing-suited skydivers who were set to feature in a significant sequence. At the same time, the toy line hit shelves, this time with a mech tech gimmick. Each character had its own specialized weapon for robot and vehicle mode. The Dark of the Moon video game also released on June 15th, a full two weeks before the release of the movie. But that actually made sense this time around. While the first two games were retellings of their movie's events, the Dark of the Moon game opted to tell a prequel story, leading right up to the film's events. It detailed the resurgence of the Decepticons, how Megatron got his new truck form, and the rise of Shockwave, all hinting towards a larger scheme by the Decepticons regarding the Apollo missions to the moon. While the details of Megatron's plan were not revealed, the campaign dovetailed quite nicely into the movie's release. Alongside that, much like Revenge of the Fallen and War for Cybertron before it, Dark of the Moon's multiplayer was a huge success. While it was pretty much identical to War for Cybertron's multiplayer, that at least meant it was being built on a solid foundation, allowing fans to once again customize their own Transformers, this time with models taken straight from the movie. Then, of course, Dark of the Moon was the center of an extensive product tie-in blitz, partnering with brands like Burger King, Chevy, ESPN, and even AA Paper. This tie-in push could rival or even surpass the tie-ins for the first and second film. How the Burger King commercial even sees a massive fight between Optimus and Shockwave, and the Chevy commercial features a fairly clever tagline. You may never have to outrun a Decepticon invasion. It's just nice to know you can. All of which led to June 29th, 2011. After all of the TV spots, posters, commercials, after two years since the release of Revenge of the Fallen, Dark of the Moon had finally arrived. Transformers was back on the big screen once again, hopefully better than it was last time, and fans journeyed to theaters in droves for one of 2011's most anticipated films. We were once a peaceful race of intelligent mechanical beings, but then came the war. Once again, Transformers 3 kicks off with narration from Optimus Prime, this time narrating our best look at a live-action Cybertron yet. It's an interesting new take that looks pretty neat in these wide shots. Now, this opening tells of an Autobot ship attempting to escape Cybertron in the final days of the war, but after being pursued by Decepticons, it was shot down, left to drift in the sea of space only to wind up crashing on Earth's moon in 1961. From here, the opening more or less chronicles the same story seen in the teaser trailer, as the arrival of the ship sparks the space race between the US and the Soviet Union. And honestly, this entire sequence is pretty solid. The combination of archival and new footage here really gets across the excitement and awe that this first moon landing was able to elicit. It's unapologetic about how incredible this event really was. Although it does divert into the more conspiratorial side, but in a way that's pulp be fun, as Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin investigate the crashed ship, taking photos and samples all before swiftly returning to Earth to be celebrated with no one back home knowing what they truly found on the moon's surface. But we do. We know that they found the Transformers and stuff. <laughs> Now, just one question remains. Is Dark of the Moon better than Revenge of the Fallen? Well, yes. Dark of the Moon is a better movie. But at the same time, if you hated Revenge of the Fallen, this one doesn't do much to win back your favor. Except maybe this one little piece of info. The twins are not back in Transformers 3. Although they do make a cameo appearance right there. You know, see it behind the other Autobots? I found it. I found their brief appearance. I'll take that $25,000 now, Mr. Bay. Though this movie does still have Wheelie, who's now joined by another friend, Brains, who are both voiced by the same actors that voice the twins, so their demonic spirit still lives on. Once again, this story focuses on Sam Witwicky, who, after having saved the world twice in the previous movies, is now eager for a job where he matters. Ultimately, it just kind of seems like the movie hates him, because even his new girlfriend Carly has a job, a much more prestigious job at that. You know the demoralizing is? They've saved the world twice and still be groveling for a job? Her job also leads to the introduction of her boss, Dylan Gould, who actually gives Carly a two 
$200,000 Mercedes, to which Sam is justifiably frustrated and wants to sell it to buy a house. Which they don't do, by the way. But Sam does eventually get a job, and the movie spends an undue amount of time on it. Much like the college stuff from the second movie, this is the weakest stuff here. But hey, John Malkovich is having fun. Um, why is Chantel using what appears to be a red cup from the red floor when we are on the yellow floor? I'm on it. It is a visual and therefore a visceral betrayal. Stop it. Ken Jong's also here as Jerry Wang, who straddles Sam in a bathroom stall, leading to a <coughs> hilarious gay panic joke. Although unlike Leo from Transformers 2, this movie quickly gets rid of Jerry Wang. Oh, I didn't mean kill the guy, I just meant that he didn't have to show up again. Come on, dude. Francis McDormand is here also, yet another Coen Brothers alum, who takes on the role of Nest's new intelligence director. Kind of taking on the Galloway role from the second movie. Only this movie likes this character a lot more. But I know what you're thinking. Isn't this a Transformers movie? What are the robots up to? Well, we have the returning Autobots, Optimus Prime, Ironhide, Bumblebee, Ratchet, and Sideswipe, along with newcomers Mirage, or sorry, Sorry, actually his name is Dino, sorry about that. And Wheeljack, oh, nope, his name is Q. Okay, cool, I got that straight now, we're all good. And it's through them that the main plot of the movie is able to develop, still going full tilt into the pulpy fun, with Buzz Aldrin even showing up to talk to Optimus Prime. It's nuts. And from a fellow space traveler, it's a true honor. The honor is mine. It's here that the plot of the movie kicks off. Building off of the opening scene, the Autobots rediscover their long-lost ship, the Ark, as well as its captain, Sentinel Prime, who carries a secret Autobot technology. Five pillars with the capability of opening a space bridge across the cosmos. With this discovery, Optimus wastes no time bringing Sentinel and the five pillars back to Earth, where via use of the Matrix, Optimus revives his old mentor. And maybe it's the gravitas of Leonard Nimoy's voice, but this character is pretty interesting. Getting to see a very different Autobot leader than Optimus is a welcome change of pace. I like him. I think he's cool. The Decepticons must never know the space bridge is here, for in their hands it would mean the end of your world. And it's nice that Optimus and Sentinel have a moment, albeit brief, where they just talk for a little bit. It's a different side to Optimus, he just has this respect for his old mentor. I don't know, robots talking to each other is cool, what can I say? But Sentinel's revival actually plays directly into the Decepticons' hands. Reintroducing Megatron in his mad maxified new form, Starscream who's snivelly and cowardly as always, there's the new addition Shockwave and his pet Driller, who were introduced in a pretty exciting scene early on. And there's Soundwave, now earthbound with his new pet, Laserbeak, who can transform into virtually anything the movie wants him to. He even transforms into a weird pink bumblebee for a bit. It's crazy. But it turns out they wanted Sentinel to be revived. As discovered by Sam, along with the returning Simmons and his new assistant Dutch, the Decepticons have access to hundreds more of these pillars, and they've been waiting all of this time for Sentinel to be revived, as he's the only one who can activate them. Which leads to a massive chase scene where the Dreads chase after Sentinel Prime, in a scene that uses footage from the island. Hmm. But it's nice that after an hour of build-up, there's finally some action going on. Something of consequence is happening. Ironhide even gets involved, working with Sideswipe to take out the Dreads in a pretty cool sequence. Decepticon Punk. But all this does is show that the Decepticons will stop at nothing to retrieve Sentinel Prime. The dude's gotta be protected. He's the key to the Decepticons' entire plan. Indeed I am. What you must realize, my Autobot brothers, is we were never going to win the war. For the sake of our planet's survival, a deal had to be made. With Megatron. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, Sentinel, what are you doing? Oh my god, Sentinel's a traitor. He's been working with the Decepticons the whole time. As if that's not bad enough, he murdered Ironhide. Come on, man, I liked him. 
But there's no time to mourn for Ironhide as Sentinel steals back the five pillars and takes the movie in a whole new direction. As via use of the pillars, Sentinel Prime as well as Megatron bring forth a Decepticon army from the moon. Up to this point, we've only dealt with squadrons. The last movie made a big deal that there were 13 Decepticons, and now we're dealing with hundreds invading Washington, D.C. Optimus is horrified at his mentor's betrayal, but unfortunately for him, Sentinel ain't budging. On Cybertron, we were gods, and here, they call us machines. Though there is a nice reference to the G1 episode Atlantis Arise, where Megatron sits in the Lincoln Memorial. The only difference is that in the cartoon, Megatron gently sets the Lincoln statue aside, whereas here, Megatron pulls a John Wilkes Booth on the guy. <laughs> But even with Sentinel's betrayal, the movie's not done with twist villains, as Dylan Gould, Carly's boss, is also working with the Decepticons. And that car he gave Carly? Well... <laughs> It's Soundwave. Ah oh man, the Decepticons aren't playing around this time. In fact, they go full G1 on us as the movie becomes the two-parter Megatron's master plan. It is here that the Decepticons and Sentinel Prime wind up coercing the governments of the world to exile the Autobots from the Earth. Which leads to a decently solid scene where Sam has to say goodbye to Optimus Prime and Bumblebee. As much as these movies have abandoned a lot of the humanity from the first one, there's still the occasional human moment. But it ends in tragedy, as after the Autobots launch away from the Earth, Starscream intercepts. He was waiting for them, ready to strike when the moment arrived. Your eyes do not deceive you. The Autobots are gone. It truly is the darkest hour as the Decepticons are free to invade the Earth, unleashing their forces on the city of Chicago. Finally, after over 90 minutes of runtime, we get to the part of the movie everyone's here for. The final showdown in Chicago. The destruction is immense, the scale of it is just massive. It really feels like Sam, who's now joined by Epps, is completely out of his element. That is until... We will kill them all. Yeah, the Autobots are back! All of them, Optimus, Bumblebee, Sideswipe, even the newly introduced Wreckers, Leadfoot, Topspin, and Roadbuster. Turns out this was their plan from the start, to prove to the government that the Decepticons cannot be left alone. So, wait, Optimus, you decided to let countless innocent people die just to prove a point to the US government? That is once again psycho behavior. Ratchet is right there if you need a doctor. But this leads to the final hour of the movie, the massive final stretch of action in Chicago. And the filmmaking that brings this last hour together is genuinely astonishing. Each sequence is bigger than the last, the practical effects combined with the visual effects is a joy to behold. It's perhaps some of the biggest action blockbuster filmmaking put on display Ever. It really feels like Michael Bay has just been given the city of Chicago and he's able to do with it as he pleases. While each sequence is a little disconnected from one another, they each have lots to show off. From Sam's rescue of Carly at the edge of Trump Tower, which also results in the death of Laserbeak, to a quick standoff between the Wreckers and Shockwave. And of course, to the arrival of Nest soldiers via wingsuits. This sequence is genuinely amazing to look at. The fact that there are real people soaring through the skyscrapers in Chicago leads to plenty of breathtaking images. It also gave plenty of justification for seeing this movie in 3D. After that is a show of visual effects that even rivals that of Devastator from the previous movie. As after a failed attempt to destroy the pillars from a high rise, Sam, Epps, and Carly are trapped in a building as Shockwave deploys his driller. And the driller just lays waste to the building, tearing it apart, choking it at the center, forcing it to collapse onto its side. It's a show of destruction so dense it just becomes a kaleidoscope scope of fire and metal and ash. But while the humans are cornered, Optimus Prime flies in to the rescue in a big heroic moment where he unleashes his jet-powered strength and destroys the driller. Although because Optimus is too overpowered, he ends up getting caught in some cables so he can be sidelined for a while. 
That's kind of lame. But hey, we do get a sequence where Sam and Carly come face to face with Starscream. And through the help of Q's gadgets and the perfect timing of Lennox's arrival, Sam is able to kill Starscream. <laughs> I'm starting to notice a pattern here. It seems almost all of these scenes end with a Decepticon kicking the bucket, from Laserbeak to the Driller and now Starscream. So who's next? Well, the next scene sees the Autobots inexplicably captured, leading to the brutal execution of Q. Damn, the guy didn't get a chance to do anything, and he's dead now. Although, after Wheelie and Brains infiltrate a Decepticon ship and cause it to malfunction, the rest of the captured Autobots retaliate, resulting in Bumblebee killing Soundwave. Man, we're really just taking them off the board one by one, huh? Ah well, I guess it also results in the probable demise of Wheelie and Brains, so the Decepticons aren't alone in their casualties. Ultimately, however, despite these losses, the Decepticons move forward with their plan, which is revealed to be the G-1-3 parter, the ultimate doom. You see, the Decepticons use the space bridge and they transport Cybertron to Earth. Although, weirdly enough, the 80s cartoon paid more attention to the science of transporting Cybertron to Earth. It caused tidal waves and earthquakes, whereas here, Cybertron's arrival has no effect on Earth whatsoever. But it sure looks cool. And this leads to the final stretch of action, where all of our heroes unite for a final push to destroy the pillars and stop the Decepticons' plan. It even sees the heroic return of Optimus Prime as he swoops in, destroying a legion of Decepticons in one fell swoop. Then, he brutally rips out Shockwave's eye, resulting in his death. As violent as that is, Optimus knew what he was doing. He came through, wrecked stuff, and then used Shockwave's gun to take down the control pillar, putting a pause on Sentinel's plan. This leads to a final showdown between Optimus and Sentinel Prime, while at the same time, Dylan and Sam fight to reactivate the pillar. And there is so much going on in this whole stretch, so much carnage and destruction, the movie's not letting up at all. Ultimately, however, Dylan reactivates the pillar, resuming the Decepticon's plan. Ah, things aren't looking good. Even Optimus gets his arm torn off by Sentinel. Ah, oh, no, Optimus is gonna die all over again. Whoa, Megatron's here to help? Well, after a stern talking to from Carly, Megatron realized that he was getting the short end of the stick in his arrangement with Sentinel. Huh. I guess someone in these movies can learn something after all. Ultimately, the Autobots are able to successfully destroy the Pillar, resulting in the apparent destruction of Cybertron. Ah, the Decepticons' plans have been thwarted, leaving Megatron to offer a truce to Optimus? Well, that's cool. You know, maybe that's a better way to close things out. Both sides coming to some kind of amicable agreement. A ceasefire. And perhaps it could leave things open for all new stories after this. So what's Optimus gonna do? Whoa, Optimus, whoa, 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 what, why did you do that? He offered a truce. Oh no, what are you doing with that gun? Why are you pointing it at Sentinel? Optimus, no, what are you doing? No, Optimus! Dude, okay, this needs to stop. Seeing a doctor isn't just a recommendation anymore. We need an intervention pronto. Ratchet is once again right there. But there's no time for that, as now that the Decepticons have been defeated, the plot is over. Sam and Carly reunite, and Optimus gives his end-of-movie narration. There will be days when we lose faith. Days when our allies turn against us. But the day will never come that we forsake this planet and its people. Do you feel cold? All right, five minutes ago, I was watching Optimus lay waste to Decepticons. Now I'm watching the credits. That's cool. But with that, Dark of the Moon came to a close. And once again, it was not very well received by critics. While certainly not as ravenous as they were towards Revenge of the Fallen, plenty of reviews were still quite negative regarding this third installment. But in another repeat of history, Dark of the Moon proved to be another box office success. Over its theatrical run, Dark of the Moon made a whopping 350 
$52 million domestically. While a little shy of Revenge of the Fallen's take, it far exceeded Revenge of the Fallen's worldwide gross, becoming the first Transformers movie to crack a billion with $1.1 billion worldwide. Clearly fans of the franchise were still eating up what they were being served. Transformers continued to be a box office powerhouse, and it was especially impressive in a crowded summer movie season. But with the release of the third movie, plenty of the film's stars were set to say goodbye to the franchise, with Shia LaBeouf and Michael Bay both promising to step away, leaving the door open for someone else to take the reins on the franchise. And depending on how you felt about these movies, that was either the worst news ever or the best. While the future of the live-action series was uncertain, Transformers fans could return to TV screens as Transformers Prime continued over the course of the summer with another batch of new episodes. Continuing the season's foray into episodic storytelling, the episodes this time around feature new mechanical devices, new dynamics, and continuing rivalries between Autobots and Decepticons. Like an episode where Bulkhead and RC are magnetically attached to one another, and have to work together to take down their rivals Breakdown and Arachnid. It's a fun fun one for sure, and it even resolves with Arachnid officially rejoining the Decepticons. Arachnid, it has been some time. Lord Megatron, what can I say? It's good to be back. Another episode focuses on a Cybertronian data cylinder, the contents of which end up getting uploaded into Bulkhead's brain, making him incredibly smart, as he ends up writing an equation for synthetic energon. Though it's said that if Bulkhead is allowed to complete the equation, the data from the cylinder would completely take over his mind, erasing the original Bulkhead entirely. So, ultimately, the Autobots forfeit the synthetic Energon as the data is ejected into space, saving Bulkhead. Though that doesn't mean Ratchet won't try to finish the formula, he even ends up testing a prototype version of it on himself, desperate to help Optimus in any way he can. But the incomplete formula has its side effects, greatly increasing Ratchet its anger and hostility, especially towards his good friend Optimus. You know your problem, Optimus? For such a big, strong bot, you're soft. You didn't pound Megatron into scrap when you had the chance! Many chances, in fact! Though he does eventually get due punishment from Megatron, and ultimately destroys the last of the synthetic Energon. Well, except for one small drop that manages to remain in Knockout's possession. That's not good. But by far the most interesting character in this stretch is Starscream. After having been booted from his leadership position, his place among the Decepticons has been put to the test. Though he does vow that he will never again try to overthrow Megatron's leadership. I have gained a clear understanding of my place in this universe, of who I am, of who I was always meant to be. Starscream, second in command, humble servant to Lord Megatron. But that vow is pretty disingenuous, as on a mission with Arachnid, he ends up getting abandoned by the eight-legged Decepticon and eventually wishes to join the Autobots. We've seen Starscream join the Autobots before, if only temporarily, so this isn't a massive stretch. The only problem? The shoe eventually drops that he murdered Cliffjumper, resulting in RC nearly beating him to scrap. But ultimately, RC lets him go, realizing that murdering him out of revenge would not be the Autobot way. You see, Movie Optimus, murder is not good, so why do you do it so much? But following this, Starscream is able to walk off towards the horizon, free to travel the Earth without the shackles of the Autobots or the Decepticons. I have been a fool, made mistakes, monumental ones. But I have gained a clear understanding of my place in this universe, of who I am. Starscream. Aligned with no side, servant to no one. Oh boy, Starscream's a rogue agent. That's pretty neat. This could lead to some very interesting stories in the future. Stories that wouldn't be told immediately, however, as the show went on a brief hiatus after this. But hey, there's only four more episodes to go in the season, and if the Comic-Con teaser is anything to go by, they'll be the biggest episodes yet. Meanwhile, as the summer continued, Dark of the Moon continued to dominate the box office, and even managed to get a quick IMAX re-release at the end of August, which all led to the release of the 
DVD and Blu-ray on September 30th, though this time there was no two-disc special edition. At least not yet, anyway, because there were plans to release something along those lines around Christmas. But eventually, following the DVD Blu-ray release of Dark of the Moon, Transformers Prime's brief hiatus was over. Fans were now able to return to TV screens once more for the final four episodes of the season, the first of which was ominously titled, One Shall Fall. And it was written in the covenant of Primus that when the 47 spheres align, a perpetual conflict will culminate upon a world forged from chaos. And the weak shall perish in the shadow of a rising darkness. With a very ominous Doom prophecy, this episode kicks things off with a bang. Not only putting Raphael in imminent danger, but also once again reviving the thread on Dark Energon. After Megatron's failed attempt to conjure an army in the first five episodes, he is now once again desperate to come across more Dark Energon for his nefarious schemes. All the while, this Doom prophecy is coming to fruition, which leads both the Autobots and Decepticons to getting a little antsy with each other. They all know something big is about to go down, and it's Optimus Prime who finally lays down the hammer. If there can be no diplomatic solution to this perpetual conflict, then I must not allow more darkness to fall upon this or any planet. Megatron must be destroyed. Which leads to the best fight in the show so far. Optimus Prime and Megatron go head to head at the site of this volcanic eruption. It's massive, it's fast, it's energetic, and there's tons of clever moments. But it doesn't end well for Optimus as the prophesized 47 sphere alignment hits resulting in the volcano exploding with dark energon? Oh, this is all bad news. This is a solid show, dude. But it doesn't stop there, as the larger consequences of this planetary alignment are dealt with in the following three episodes titled, One Shall Rise. As it turns out, the dark energon erupting from beneath the Earth is far more alarming than it already was, because it's revealed that beneath the Earth's surface, at its very core, there lives a Cybertronian being with dark energon flowing through their veins. Unicron. That's right, in a much different approach to the Ultimate Transformers villain, this show posits that Unicron lives inside the Earth itself, and the Autobots must find a way to stop him before his morning stretch destroys the entire planet. Ah, dude, this is by far the best arc of the series, and it only gets better as the Autobots end up facing off against manifestations of Unicron erupting from the ground. These manifestations grow larger and larger. There's even one that's the size of a Titan. The Autobots are totally outmatched in this fight, at least until someone intervenes. What is it? What happened? I happened. Megatron's gonna help the Autobots? But wasn't he hell-bent on killing Optimus earlier? Well, it turns out a stern talking to from Unicron clears the senses up a little bit. Unicron had no respect for Megatron. In fact, Unicron's strength became a direct threat to Megatron's power. So now, both Optimus and Megatron have a common enemy, uniting them to defeat Unicron once and for all. A truce between Autobot and Decepticon. How long do you expect us to believe that will last? Only as long as is mutually beneficial. How can they defeat Unicron, though? How can they stop this guy without destroying the Earth in the process? Well, in keeping with traditions set up by the 1986 movie, the only thing that can defeat Unicron is the Matrix of Leadership, carried by Optimus Prime. And Megatron is the only one capable of leading the Autobots to Unicron's very spark, to return him to dormancy. Which leads nicely into the final episode of the season, which sees the Autobots along with Megatron journey to the core of the Earth, making their way towards Unicron's spark. At the same time, Megatron's extended absence is leaving the Decepticons antsy. Arachnid takes advantage of this, plotting to take over the Decepticons, leaving Megatron and Earth behind in the process. Although in a pretty cool scene, Soundwave stands up against Arachnid, forever loyal to Megatron and within seconds, he takes Arachnid down without even breaking a sweat. Watch out for the quiet ones. 
At the same time, Ratchet informs the human characters of the long and complex history between Optimus and Megatron, revealing that they weren't always sworn enemies, and that this recent union is not unprecedented. In a sequence with pretty cool animation, Ratchet reveals that Orion Pax, a historian, and Megatronus, a gladiator, were once allies, friends even, until Megatronus shortened his name to Megatron upon turning his attention to politics, where he revealed that he wanted to change Cybertron with force. In contrast, Orion Pax proposed a far more elegant way of reshaping Cybertron, and it was his proposal that was ultimately heard, thwarting Megatron's ambitions, resulting in him gathering his loyal followers, Soundwave chief among them, creating the Decepticons, and starting the war. As such, in a moment very similar to what was seen in the War for Cybertron video game, Orion Pax journey to the core of Cybertron, where he was bestowed the Matrix of Leadership and became Optimus Prime. This is most definitely a result of Hasbro's quest to unify their approach to Transformers. It's the most detailed and consistent origin for Optimus and Megatron ever brought to screen. An origin that even feeds directly into the present conflict, as it makes it all the more thrilling to see Optimus and Megatron fight side by side against Unicron. Ultimately, Optimus and Megatron reach Unicron's spark, and in a final climactic moment, Optimus unleashes the power of the Matrix, lighting their darkest hour, and returns Unicron to dormancy. Ah, good job, Optimus. You did it. The Earth is safe. Unicron has been defeated. Although this victory is not free of consequence, as immediately after Unicron's defeat, Megatron sticks to his word. The Union should only last as long as it is mutually beneficial official. Where are we, Megatronus? Wait a minute. Something's happened to Optimus. Why did he call me that? What did you do to him? Who are they? Our mortal enemies! We're outnumbered. Go! I'll cover you! Optimus has lost his memories, and thanks to Megatron's quick thinking, he's taken back to the Decepticon warship, turning against the Autobots who were once his friends. Just when I thought things would work out, Optimus joins the Decepticons. At ease, Breakdown. That is no way to welcome a long-lost comrade. Orion Pax is one of us. And that's the end of Season 1. Aw oh man, I have to see how this resolves. I have to see how Season 2 deals with this. Too bad the next season is months away. At least a teaser was released pretty much immediately, showing Knockout fashioning Orion Pax an all-new Decepticon badge. That just makes me want to watch it more. Come on! Overall, Season 1 of Transformers Prime was some of the best Transformers brought to screens. While there were some issues, the animation coupled with high-stakes stories allowed it to break the mold of what a Transformers story could be. But fans of the show were left waiting after Season 1's groundbreaking cliffhanger. But it's not like they were completely starved for Transformers material, as immediately after Prime's conclusion, High Moon Studios stepped up to the plate to officially announce their sequel to War for Cybertron, titled... Fall of Cybertron. Revealed in an all-new Game Informer magazine, Fall of Cybertron would see an all-new look for Optimus Prime, as well as the inclusion of the fan-favorite Dinobots, the leader of which, Grimlock, became the center of the first teaser trailer. On top of all of this, toy shelves were now being filled by Creo, Hasbro's latest attempt at a Lego knockoff, with buildable figures like Optimus Prime, Megatron, and Bumblebee, who all came packaged with a series of minifigures, or Creons, alongside them, which were the center of some fun commercials here and there. 
Simultaneously, TV screens were also filled up by Rescue Bots, the second Transformers show to debut on the hub, geared for much younger kids, this time focusing on all new characters who join with a group of humans to stop crime and save a small town every week. It's small scale, it has no Decepticons, but it introduces even the youngest of kids to Transformers, and for older fans, well, you would get the occasional cameo from Optimus Prime or Bumblebee, tying this show in with the larger aligned continuity. A continuity that was about to expand even further with Fall of Cybertron. The initial marketing push kicked off over the holiday season as High Moon released an all-new teaser trailer at the Video Game Awards on December 10th. Angel, Angel, what have I done? Boy, now this is one hell of a teaser. While it is completely devoid of any gameplay, it does display an incredibly melancholy feel to the proceedings. With its dark, destroyed atmosphere and neon lights piercing through, this was some of the best looking Transformers material ever, rivaling that of the blockbuster movies. In fact, fans who were disappointed in the movies felt that if this was extended to two hours, it could easily be a fantastic feature film. A feeling that was bolstered by the trailer's eventual reveal of the combatic who combine to form Bruticus, as well as Grimlock, who transforms into a T-Rex. It's good stuff all around. Following that, High Moon Studios even released a behind-the-scenes video about the trailer, talking about their approach, digital domains involvement, as well as the difficulty of picking a song to sell this feeling of loss and hopelessness, eventually landing on The Humbling River by Pucifer. For the announcement trailer, we really wanted fans and non-fans alike to look at Transformers like they'd never seen it before. You know, if you were familiar with the property, if you've seen the movies, or if you haven't, or if you grew up with it as a kid, we wanted to do something that made you look twice. Overall, the reveal managed to get Transformers fans incredibly excited for the future, as Fall of Cybertron easily positioned itself as the biggest Transformers event of 2012. 2012 got off to a quick start, not just with the first trailer for the upcoming debut of Transformers Prime's second season, but also the January 31st release of the Transformers Dark of the Moon 3D Blu-ray Combo Pack, as well as the Ultimate Trilogy box set, of which there were only 5,000 sold, each signed individually by Michael Bay. Now, if you bought any of this, you not only got the movie in 3D and 2D, but you also got a two-hour behind-the-scenes documentary chronicling the making of Transformers 3. From the negative response to Revenge of the Fallen, to the creation of an all-new story with new characters, to the immense production cycle across the United States, including the devastation the production wrought to Chicago. There's a behind-the-scenes look at the wingsuit skydive scene, covering how immensely complicated the planning and execution was, and how it all came together for the final sequence. And of course, the documentary tackled the immense scale visual effects on the part of ILM and Digital Domain, most specifically talking about the driller sequence with the tilted building. And to cap it all off, the documentary concluded with a look at the sound design, all in lead up to the movie's release. It was quite an informative documentary that highlighted plenty of the film's highs and lows throughout its production cycle. And the deep dives into the visual effects and sound design were perfectly timed as Transformers was once again nominated for a couple Oscars. This time, Dark of the Moon was nominated for sound mixing, sound editing, and visual effects, like the first movie before it. Although ultimately, once again, Transformers came out empty-handed. But hey, at least they also didn't win any Razzies this year, so... Go team! All of which led to the day where, after months of stewing on the possibility, Michael Bay officially signed on to direct Transformers 4, set for release in June 2014. Although he would release the movie Pain and Gain in the interim. This was either fantastic news for fans of the franchise, or terrible news for people who desperately wanted someone else to take the reins. Either way, Transformers 4 promised to take the film series in a different direction, while still being a direct sequel to Dark of the Moon. All in all, it seems Transformers fans have plenty to scratch their itch over the course of the year, and that was especially true of TV fans who could finally return to TV screens as Season 2 of Transformers Prime finally debuted on February 18th.
Season 2 kicks off with a three-part premiere aptly titled Orion Pax. Picking up right where Season 1 left off, it sees Optimus now reverted back to Orion Pax under the thrall of Megatron. Though in a creative twist, Orion is not just evil all of a sudden. In fact, Megatron is pulling the wool over his eyes, deceiving Orion into serving his larger interests. Why are we called Decepticons? Another craven Autobot scare tactic. The name was meant to demonize us. Instead, we wear it as a badge of honor. For if speaking the truth is deception, then we are gladly guilty. Now, Orion Pax is not nearly as skilled in a fight as Optimus was, so instead Megatron tasks him to use his archiving skills to decode the Iacon database, which reveals a series of coordinates for artifacts or, worse yet, weapons of mass destruction. Although Megatron's deception begins to crumble once the rogue agent Starscream makes his way onto the ship, throwing everything Orion's learned into question. Lord Megatron says many things, only some of which are true. You do not suggest that our leader would speak falsehoods. <laughs> you truly are being kept in the dark, aren't you? While Starscream can't reveal the entire truth to Orion, he is able to, in a relatively unexpected turn of events, help the Autobots to retrieve their leader, as he reveals the location of the Decepticon's new space bridge, which ultimately feeds right into the Autobots' plan to restore Optimus' memories. Because upon learning of its location, the Autobots commandeer the space bridge and send Jack and RC to Cybertron to locate the mysterious Vector Sigma, which can reconstitute the knowledge held within the matrix of leadership. Sounds simple enough, right? Well, not when you throw Scraplets and an Insecticon into the mix. But in a clever move, Jack turns the Scraplets against the Insecticon, getting rid of two birds with one stone, allowing him to successfully rejuvenate the Matrix. At the same time, Orion's suspicions lead to a breaking point, where his strong ideologies finally rise to the surface, and he realizes that his place is not with the Decepticons. My sympathies lie with the Autobots. And you are not one of us. Which leads to Jack, upon returning to Earth, bestowing the restored Matrix to Orion Pax, restoring his memories, bringing back Optimus Prime. No! Megatron? Be gone! Ah, Optimus Prime is back, united with the Autobots once again, foiling Megatron's plan. Although as satisfying as this is, it is a tiny bit rushed and it does tie things up a little too neatly. That being said, having Optimus back is a welcome relief and it establishes the new, albeit similar, status quo for the rest of Season 2, where it continues the episodic storytelling established in the first season, now with more serialized elements. From an episode where Wheeljack makes a welcome return, coining a new catchphrase with best bud, Bulkhead. At least let me call for backup. You know records don't call for backup. They, they call, call for, for cleanup. Clean as well as the introduction of a new Decepticon voiced by Tony Todd, Dreadwing, the twin brother of the deceased Skyquake from Season 1. Although Dreadwing doesn't know about the part where Starscream brought Skyquake from the dead and now he's a mindless zombie wandering around a parallel dimension, so let's keep that between us, alright? There's an episode where Arachnid gets booted from the Decepticons due to her attempted takeover at the end of Season 1, though upon becoming a rogue agent, she ends up murdering Breakdown, fairly unceremoniously. But her newfound freedom does result in her discovering an entire legion of Insecticons buried beneath the Earth in stasis pods. And boy, does Arachnid use them to her advantage, sicking them on Megatron in the episode Armada, which also features Starscream's latest attempt on Megatron. Megatron's life. In a move very similar to his animated counterpart, Starscream creates his own clone armada to murder Megatron. Unfortunately for Arachnid and Starscream, both of their attempts to destroy Megatron fail, as Starscream's clones are destroyed and Arachnid is imprisoned in an Insecticon cocoon by RC, severing her connection with the Insecticon army, leading them to fall in line with the next strongest leader they can find. Forgive us, one true lord and master. 
this day has certainly seen its share of thwarted intentions. On top of that, the season sees the return of Mech, who finally created their own transforming machine, a near-perfect replica of Optimus Prime, aptly dubbed Nemesis Prime. And it leads to a climactic battle between the two Primes, leading to Optimus getting the upper hand, destroying the clone, as well as nearly killing Silas in the process. It's a move that kind of concludes Mech's running arc. That being said, they do have the body of Breakdown in their possession, so maybe they'll make a startling return. But all of this is the fun and games background to the overarching premise of Season 2, which is the hunt for ancient relics hidden across the Earth. Following up on the premiere where Orion Pax decoded three sets of coordinates from the Iacon database, the Autobots and Decepticons begin a hunt for control of these relics. The first three include the Spark Extractor, which is taken by the Autobots, the Shield Thing that isn't given a name, but that doesn't matter as it's destroyed by the third relic, the Forge of Solus Prime, a tool that can create anything the user desires from raw material. On the downside, it ends up in the hands of Megatron, although perhaps that isn't such a bad thing. It is as I suspected. Without the power of a prime to activate it, the forge is merely another addition to our tool chest. Eventually, four more sets of coordinates are decoded. As such, the Autobots and Decepticons split up in a race to retrieve the relics across four episodes, which, in a fun twist, all take place at the exact same time, with each episode focusing on the quest for one of these relics. Firstly, Bumblebee and RC journey to the underground New York subways to retrieve the Phase Shifter from Knockout, a device that allows the user to pass through solid objects. Next, Optimus and Dreadwing lock blades in a battle for the Apex armor, which ultimately falls into the hands of Starscream. Although the episode does explore an interesting dynamic between Optimus and Dreadwing, as Optimus believes that Dreadwing may one day stray away from the Decepticons in a quest for peace. Maybe a long shot, but who knows? Optimus can be right about these things from time to time. Alongside that, Ratchet forms an unlikely friendship with Wheeljack as they face off against Soundwave for the Resonance Blaster, leading to a pretty sweet fight between Wheeljack and Soundwave. Although, Ratchet sacrifices the relic to instead plant a backdoor virus to transmit the entire Iacon database to the Autobots, allowing Optimus to decode the remaining entries before the Decepticons can. And finally, tying all all four episodes together, Bulkhead faces off against a couple Insecticons led by Hardshell over control of a toxic form of Energon known as Tox-N. The stuff weakens Bulkhead significantly, greatly impairing his ability to fight the Insecticons. That is, until he finally destroys the Tox-N, preventing it from reaching Decepticon hands. Alright, good job Bulkhead! Now come on home for a well-deserved nap. Whoa, is Bulkhead gonna die? A question echoed across the fandom that unfortunately wouldn't be answered for a while as Transformers Prime went on hiatus. Aw oh man, I gotta see how this resolves. I gotta see if Bulkhead's gonna make it out of this alive. Despite the cliffhanger, Transformers Prime was still among the franchise's best shows according to many fans who were fully invested in this latest take on the robots in disguise. In fact, the first season even got nominated for five daytime Emmy Awards. Transformers is back on the awards train. Let's go. During Prime's hiatus, however, Transformers fans still had plenty to chew on, like how Aaron Kruger would return to write Transformers 4, which promised to introduce an all-new cast of humans and Transformers. Following that, Transformers became a massive theme park attraction, Transformers The Ride, a six-minute adventure unlike anything fans had seen before. While it had already opened in Singapore in December, it was now open at Universal Studios Hollywood, expanding its reach to good old California. California. And on top of that, the marketing push for Transformers Fall of Cybertron was now in full swing, now given the official release date of August 28th. The marketing kicked off in March with the first look at gameplay, showing off the impressive roster of characters as well as High Moon's focus on variety, especially in contrast to the first game. There was even a reveal of Grimlock gameplay, as he promised to play completely differently than any of the other characters in the game. The inclusion of the Dinobots coupled with an all-new origin 
for them was already enough to get Transformers fans excited, but the hype really started rolling once Fall of Cybertron made an appearance at E3, debuting an all-new cinematic trailer. In another two-minute extravaganza of Transformers eye candy, this trailer shows off yet another massive battle scene on Cybertron. From a battle between the Dinobots and Bruticus, to a standoff between Optimus Prime and Megatron, leading to the ultimate showstopper, the reveal of Metroplex. Metroplex heeds the call of the last prime. Aw, oh, dude, are you kidding? That looks so awesome! But that was merely a precursor to the expansive coverage across the rest of E3. High Moon Studios revealed plenty of action-packed gameplay, including looks at the Optimus Prime level with Metroplex and some Starscream gameplay, displaying how two characters could play so differently despite being in the same game. And with excitement at an all-time high, High Moon Studios announced that the game would release one week earlier than planned, now set to debut on August 21st. Fall of Cybertron even had a small presence at Comic-Con, revealing more gameplay footage which also led to a full reveal of the competitive multiplayer side of the game, featuring an all-new expansive customization tool. For the first time, you really could create your own Transformers character. Die-hard G1 fans could even pre-order the game from GameStop to get the G1 Retro Pack, which included some G1-inspired weapons as well as a G1 skin for Optimus Prime. Fall of Cybertron promised to be the best Transformers game ever, far exceeding the already well-received War for Cybertron. And eventually, after fans' excitement reached a fever pitch, it all led to August 21st, 2012. Finally, the game was on store shelves, and fans everywhere could experience an all-new chapter in the Transformers War. Following up on the events of War for Cybertron, the Autobots have all but lost the war against the Decepticons. They're scrounging for Energon, the fuel they need to power their transport, the Ark. All in a plea to leave Cybertron, their most desperate mission yet. All the while, the Decepticons have hammered them into a single corner of Cybertron, leaving them not much left to survive on. They're in pretty rough shape. Optimus, I need your help! Ratchet, how can I help? Silverbolt's leak too much Energon. We need to stabilize his power. Grab that cable! Now, plug it into his power supply. We blew a regulator! We need that power online! And in keeping with the gameplay of War for Cybertron, the Autobots and Decepticons do battle in massive set pieces, this time with a variety of different types of locations, from cities to abandoned ruins to even a massive transforming bridge. But unlike War for Cybertron, this game slows down from time to time, allowing players to catch a glimpse at Cybertron, or at least some of the few corners that are still left. The world building and attention to detail with Cybertron is plentiful in this game, it's pretty cool. Scale is also on full display, not just with that aforementioned bridge, but with the colossal Metroplex, who was activated early on by Optimus Prime, turning the tide of battle against the Decepticons. Metroplex, take it out! My Primus! But that's not all the Autobots have going on, as they're also searching for their lost teammate Grimlock, who went AWOL with his team prior to the game's events, sparking a mystery that spans many of the Autobot missions. On the other side of the coin, the Decepticon story sees them experience a sudden change in leadership, because once Megatron comes into contact with Metroplex, he's immediately flattened into a pancake, leaving Starscream to take command. Decepticons! Megatron has perished, betrayed by his foolish pride. I, Starscream, am your leader now! 
Of course, this is a change that doesn't sit well with plenty of the Decepticons, most notably Soundwave, who makes haste and rebuilds Megatron in a whole new body. And oh boy is he angry, as he immediately boots Starscream from the Decepticons in a manner very similar to the 1986 movie. Who disrupts my coronation? Coronation Starscream? This is bad comedy. Who dares to disrupt my coronation? Coronation Starscream! This is bad comedy! Ultimately, all culminates in the final couple levels, where everything leads back to Grimlock and his team, who are revealed to have been captured by the Decepticon mad scientist Shockwave, who experimented on them, giving them new forms inspired by creatures from a distant world. Together, the team now known as the Dinobots reunite and discover their new alternate forms. Grimlock gets the most spotlight in this arena, as the player is occasionally able to transform him into a T-Rex to fight off Decepticons and sometimes Insecticons. With a trio of boss fights against the Insecticon leaders Hardshell, Kickback, and Sharpshot. But Shockwave wasn't just experimenting on the Dinobots, his plans are far larger than that. As it's revealed he's discovered this massive space bridge tower, and has used it to create a portal to a world on the other side of the universe, rich with energy. Leading to a massive final battle as the Autobots finally launch towards the portal. With the Decepticons close behind. It's a massive clash of good versus evil, and it even gives the player the choice between Optimus Prime and Megatron in the final battle. After eons of conflict, I finally see the truth of your words, Megatron. And what might that be, Optimus? This universe, no matter how vast, will never be big enough for you and I to coexist. And ultimately, all comes to an end when both ships plummet through the space bridge portal as it collapses. And while it's never seen what happens once they pass through, their next stop is most definitely... Earth. Telling an expansive story chronicling a defining chapter in Transformers history, this game was immediately welcomed by fans, who enjoyed the G1 aesthetic, the references, the callbacks, and of course, the variety of characters. Over the course of the story, you play as Bumblebee, Optimus Prime, Cliffjumper, Jazz, Vortex, Swindle, the combined form of the Combaticons Bruticus, Megatron, Starscream, Grimlock, and in the final level alone, Soundwave, Jetfire, Bruticus again, Jazz again, and finally Optimus or Megatron in the final battle. The game also sports a legion of non-playable characters during the campaign, from Ratchet, Warpath, Silver Bolt, Air Raid, Sideswipe, Perceptor, and Shockwave to the other Dinobots Swoop, Slug, Snarl, and Sludge, and the remaining Combaticons Onslaught, Brawl, and Blastoff. The only downside was that this game was a purely single-player affair. You couldn't journey the campaign with two friends like you could in War for Cybertron. But that sacrifice is redeemed with greater variety on all levels, not just with the types of enemies, from the regular foot soldiers to the much larger Decepticon Leapers, where you have to shoot in the back to take down. But on top of that, every character has a unique ability that helps them stand out, all of which is also reflected in the level design. Optimus Prime's control of Metroplex's artillery works wonders in the wide open arenas. Jazz's grapple hook is able to latch onto platforms all across his level, and Bruticus just gets tons of destructible objects that are a blast to take down. But the campaign was only one of the game's features, as Fall of Cybertron also featured a cooperative game mode called Escalation a wave-based game mode that was in War for Cybertron, but it got a whole new facelift here. It's here that four players work together to defeat wave after wave of enemies. The longer you survive, the more points you acquire, allowing you to unlock new areas and new weapons. A great emphasis is placed on each team member's role, as they're each given a specific ability that helps them win the fight. Each team member has to do their job, or the team loses. And ultimately, if you beat 15 waves of enemies, you win the game. That part was perhaps the most different from War for Cybertron, where Escalation could go on forever. But the game mode players would spend most of their time in was Competitive Multiplayer, which featured the most expansive customization tool yet, and you bet that I spent a lot of time here when the game came out, creating custom Transformers in each of the four classes, although ultimately I'd save one slot to have a robot that was essentially just Optimus Prime. You gotta have that guy in there somehow, you know? With a handful of game modes and an impressive 
aggressive customization tool, fans were able to jump into arenas as their own creation in consistently fun and new battles alongside or against their friends. All of this amounted to an instant fan favorite Transformers experience, one that garnered plenty of good word of mouth, with a bunch of solid reviews coming out at the time of release. Fall of Cybertron was all fans could have really wanted, and at times there was stuff in there that fans didn't know they wanted, and it ultimately came together to form another impressive touchstone in Hasbro's ongoing aligned continuity. But even with the game now in players' hands, fans did have to take some time away from Fall of Cybertron week to week, as Transformers Prime's second season was finally back after its hiatus, promising to release new episodes every week until the season's end later in the fall, starting with the 16th episode aptly titled Hurt. Picking up in the immediate wake of Bulkhead's severe injuries, this episode sees Miko team up with Wheeljack to seek out revenge, which leads to a pretty big fight between Wheeljack and Hardshell, the con who nearly killed Bulkhead. Although, ultimately, it is Miko that pulls the final trigger, killing Hardshell herself. It shows a darker, more serious side to Miko, which is an interesting change of pace from her usual up-for-anything attitude. The episode also sheds light on the ultimately empty feeling you have once you've gotten revenge, proving it is not all it's cracked up to be. Ultimately, however, Bulkhead will survive his injuries, but recovery will take some time. A handful of episodes, in fact, each one seeing Bulkhead slowly return to his former self. First up is an episode where RC tries to comfort Miko, telling her a story about her now long-dead partner Cliffjumper, who isn't voiced by Dwayne The Rock Johnson this time, but he's still pretty fun. So this is Kaon, huh? Love what you Decepticons have done with the place. The ruins are especially picturesque. Together, RC and Cliffjumper encounter the Decepticon mad scientist Shockwave, all in a lead up to the moment where the two of them escape his clutches and arrive on Earth to join Optimus Prime's team. Getting a spotlight episode on Cliffjumper is a lot of fun, and it kind of brings closure to the death that kicked the series off back in its pilot episode. But as smooth as Bulkhead's recovery is going, a wrench is thrown into the whole ordeal when the hot-headed Smokescreen enters the scene, because the two do not see eye to eye, even if Smokescreen proved himself by stealing back the Apex armor from Starscream. Although the two would find some common ground when they teamed up to face off against Breakdown. Wait. Breakdown? Isn't he dead? Well, this actually isn't Breakdown. It's Silas, having fully melded himself into the body of a machine, and he's trying to win favor with the Decepticons. Though that doesn't go well as his only bargaining chip turns into a failure. As such, in a cruel twist of fate, the Decepticons use Silas as their latest mad science experiment. Breakdown would be tickled. Kind of a dark end for Silas, but that is the Decepticons' M.O. Although it is nice to see these long-running plotlines converge even after being set up so long ago. And the serialized efforts coupled with the overall darker tone for the show was incredibly welcome to Transformers fans. All of which hit a stride in the final stretch of the season, where the hunt for relics would reach a fever pitch as the final episodes introduced the Omega Keys, the final four Iacon relics sent to Earth by Alpha Trion. If these four four keys are united with the Omega Lock on Cybertron, it could rejuvenate the Transformer homeworld, returning it to its former glory. Of course, this leads to plenty of battles over possession of the keys. Battles that grow in scale once Optimus Prime gets access to the Star Saber, a mystical weapon of ultimate power that can only be wielded by a Prime. With it in the Autobot's possession, Megatron turns desperate, and ends up stealing the arm of a dead Prime so that he can finally wield the Forge of Solus Prime. With this new appendage and new ability, Megatron counters Optimus with the Dark Star Saber, upping the ante on the two leaders' clashes, making them truly awesome in scope. Ultimately, three of the four Omega Keys end up in the Autobots' possession, but the whereabouts of the fourth remain a mystery to them, until it is revealed that Starscream managed to get his hands on it, which leads to a moment where, via use of speed-enhancing Energon, Starscream sneaks into the Autobot base and steals the other three keys from right under their noses. And Starscream, being the treacherous guy he is, ends up using the keys to barter his way back into Megatron's favor. 
Ooh boy, the days of Starscream as a rogue agent are over because Megatron accepts, allowing Starscream to rejoin the Decepticons. Although this does not sit well with Dreadwing because he finds out about the part where Starscream turned his dead brother into a zombie that now wanders an alternate dimension. Ah, oh, come on guys, we were supposed to keep that to ourselves. Which one of you told him? But Dreadwing's anger towards Starscream ends up serving the Autobots, as in proving Optimus' theory, Dreadwing turns against the Decepticons, giving the Autobots the Forge of Soulless Prime. Does this mean he'll join the Autobots? Betraying my kind is not the same as accepting yours. No, instead, Dreadwing takes out his anger on Starscream, acting to murder the deceitful Decepticon, until Megatron intervenes. I said stand down! That is an order! One which I cannot follow. Oh, Megatron chose the treacherous Starscream over Dreadwing. Now that's cold, dude. In fact, Megatron has become far more ruthless lately, highlighted in the final two episodes of the season where the conflict returns to the derelict world of Cybertron. It is here that the Autobots steal back the Omega Keys and reveal the Omega Lock. The Autobots are but moments away from restoring their homeworld, but Megatron throws a wrench into their plan, bringing the Autobots' human friends into the fray, saying that if the Autobots don't give up the keys, the humans will die. See, the dude's ruthless, and it leaves Optimus no choice but to surrender the Omega Keys. Now the Decepticons have nothing standing in their way from rejuvenating Cybertron, except of course Megatron's ambition to conquer more than one planet, as he instead uses the Omega Lock to cyberform Earth, working to destroy all of humanity in the process. What should I call my new domain? New Kaon? Or perhaps, Gilded Earth. But Optimus cannot condone the destruction of Earth, so he makes an unthinkable choice. To save Earth, he uses the Star Saber and destroys the Omega Lock, thus ridding both sides of the ability to restore Cybertron. A move that strikes at the heart of each Autobot, especially Ratchet, who was the most eager of any of them to return home. So you destroyed the only device in any universe capable of restoring our home? Optimus, we needed that. There's no time to mourn that, however, as despite the destruction of the Omega Lock, Megatron was still able to create a citadel for himself on Earth. In Jasper, Nevada, of all places. I mean, the show's gone to great lengths to say that there's nothing special about this town. So why did Megatron go here to start? Because the Decepticons have discovered the location of our base. Oh boy, this is all bad news, and it leads to a massive battle where the Autobots, joined by Wheeljack and Agent Fowler, attempt to defend their base from the Decepticon invasion. Although their efforts are void, as the Decepticons are simply too strong. As such, the Autobots must evacuate, spreading the team across the continent to evade the Decepticons. All except Optimus, who stays behind to destroy the bridge so the Decepticons cannot follow. Although even that is fruitless, as after all of the other Autobots escape, the Decepticons unleash a massive weapon and destroy the Autobot base, with Optimus still inside. This is the place, all right. This was the place. United we stand, divided they fall. And that's the end of Season 2. Transformers Prime kills it in its season finales, man. Which is a double-edged sword because I want to see what happens next right now. Thankfully, Transformers Prime would return for a third season, now with the added subtitle Beast Hunters. This new subtitle came with a teaser trailer unveiled at New York Comic Con, teasing the arrival of a Predacon to the Decepticon ranks. The Autobots are divided, the base is destroyed, Optimus might be dead, and now the Decepticons have 
have a dragon? Oh, I don't know how long I can wait for all of that. It sounds too good, dude. But it's not like fans were completely starved for Prime material as a video game was released in the fall of 2012. While it doesn't deal with the events of the Season 2 finale, it does provide a nice little ancillary story to go alongside the show. Although the continuity is a little dodgy, as there's no place for the game to really fit within the show's timeline. Ah well, it'll keep me occupied. Also on the video game front, Transformers Fall of Cybertron got some multiplayer DLC packs, introducing new characters that you could customize with for the competitive side. From Ultra Magnus to Hound to Zeta Prime to even the Dinobots and Insecticons, it proved to really liven up the multiplayer as the game's run continued. But all of that paled in comparison to some news finally coming out from Transformers 4, as it was confirmed that Mark Wahlberg was to be the new lead for the franchise. This came off the back of his work on Michael Bay's next movie Pain and Gain, where the working relationship was able to flourish, making the continuing collaboration on Transformers 4 a no-brainer. Now, with a lead attached, the rest of the cast started to be announced in the early months of... Kicking things off with the addition of Jack Rayner to the cast, followed up by Nicola Peltz and later Stanley Tucci and Kelsey Grammer. On top of that, word circulated that Transformers 4 would make its way to China, capitalizing on the franchise's success in the country thus far. There was even a talent show competition that would select a lucky few to have speaking roles in the final movie. That's not to say Transformers 4 wouldn't spend time in the USA, as location scouting was done across the country, from Texas to Detroit, and once again, to Chicago. But time would have to tell how exactly it would all fold into the new story, which also promised to completely redesign the robots as well. Now, despite pre-production for the movie being fully underway, Transformers 4 was still a long ways out. As such, fans set their sights on Transformers Prime's third season, which was confirmed to be a much shorter season at 13 episodes rather than 26. And in unfortunate news for fans, it was to be the last season of the show. Aw, oh, come on, man. And first animated and now Prime? Can one Transformers show last to a fourth season? Is that possible? All of this came off the back of a new lead designer taking the reins of the Transformers toy line. Before this new designer came into the fold, Season 3 of Prime was going to look very different, following on plans set up by HasLab and the Prime writers. But once the new designer took over, things changed drastically, adding the Beast Hunter subtitle, bringing in the Predacons, and ultimately deciding that Season 3 would mark the show's end end. Transformers Prime was officially on its way out, with another TV show set to hit screens sometime after Transformers 4 would dominate the summer of 2014. Ah well, despite the disappointing news, the third season was still highly anticipated by fans, with a couple trailers releasing before its debut in March, teasing the scattered Autobots trying to survive without their base, whilst also being hunted by the Predacon. At the same time, the trailers showed an incredibly badly damaged Optimus Prime, saying perhaps the most ominous thing he could say. There will be... a new... Prime. Aw oh, man, is Optimus Prime gonna die? I don't know if I can handle that emotional turmoil again, dude. He better make it out of this. Ultimately, there was nothing more exciting for Transformers fans than the continuation of Season 2's game-changing cliffhanger, and eventually all led to March 22nd, where finally, fans were able to return to TV screens for Transformers Prime's third and ultimately final season. In the immediate wake of the destruction of the Autobot base, Season 3 kicks off with a very bleak tone. The Decepticons have all but won, and with their new Fortress of Dark Mount, they have the power to destroy anything that stands in their way. The opening episodes make good on the promise of hopelessness on the side of the Autobots, as they're scattered, hunted, and without a leader. Things only get worse once Shockwave rejoins the Decepticon fold, leading to the introduction of the Spotlight New Edition.
But eventually, the Autobots do get some form of hope, as not only does Wheeljack escape from the Decepticons reuniting with Bulkhead and Miko, but Ratchet, Bumblebee, and Raph reunite. And in the most hopeful of turns, RC and Jack cross paths with none other than Ultra Magnus, a steadfast, rule-bound commander voiced by Michael Ironside. Now he, RC, and Jack work together to locate the other Autobots, starting with Wheeljack, Bulkhead, and Miko, who encounter the Predacon in this pretty massive battle. Ultimately, the Autobots evade the Predacon and end up reuniting with Ratchet, Bumblebee, Raph, as well as Agent Fowler and June Darby. Aw, oh, now this just feels right. The Autobots are back together under the command of Ultra Magnus. Well, all except two, Smokescreen and Optimus Prime, who are hidden underneath the wreckage of the Autobot base. Optimus is horribly damaged, barely able to move, and Smokescreen is desperate to find any way to restore him. In comes the Forge of Soulless Prime, which Optimus can use to bring himself back into tip-top shape. The only problem? Optimus doesn't want to use it for that. Revealing that the Forge's power is limited, Optimus instead wants Smokescreen to use its power to rebuild the Omega Lock to restore Cybertron. But doesn't the Forge still need a Prime to activate? The time for a new leader is upon us. In my spark, I believe that leader stands before me right now. No. Whoa, Smokescreen's gonna become the next Prime? I don't know how I feel about that. But there's no time to really think about it as all comes to a head in the season's fourth episode, Rebellion, where Ultra Magnus leads the Autobots to attack the Decepticon Citadel to shift the balance of power back in the Autobots' favor. And at first, the mission goes great. The Autobots manage to separate the Decepticon forces a little bit to infiltrate Darkmount. Hell, they even manage to trap the Predacon in the frozen Arctic, freezing the beast instantly. But ultimately, they're no match for the might of the Decepticons, as each Autobot is captured. Even Ultra Magnus doesn't stand a chance against the mighty Megatron. Ultra Magnus, you are no Optimus Prime. Yeah, having Optimus right now would be useful. The only problem? Optimus has succumbed to his wounds dying once again. Because of that, the Matrix presents itself to Smokescreen so that he can become the next Prime. This isn't how the story's supposed to end. But Smokescreen's not gonna take it, as he instead uses the last of the Forge's power to rebuild and restore Optimus Prime. And in the Autobots' most desperate hour, after all of their forces are captured, a light shines from the end of the tunnel. Oh, now that's what I'm talking about. An Uber Optimus? I mean, come on, that's just cool. And with his help, the Autobots manage to retaliate against the Decepticons, allowing Agent Fowler and the Air Force to destroy Darkmount. While the Decepticons do manage to escape, the Autobots have secured a massive victory against them, and have even managed to find themselves a new base. While this resolution is certainly a little rushed, and kind of resets the status quo back to what it was, taken on its own, this four-part premiere is a very satisfying conclusion to Season 2's cliffhanger. Optimus is back in an all-new body, the Decepticons are on the back foot, and the team is fully reunited for the future. And this leads right into the remainder of the season, which now features an all-new intro sequence. The next stretch of episodes continues the semi-episodic, semi-serialized nature of the previous seasons, this time following the Decepticons as they hunt for Predacon bones on Earth to clone an army of beasts. Even the first Predacon manages to come back, rejoining the Decepticons. At the same time, there's some inner conflict among the Autobots, as the rule-bound nature of Ultra Magnus' command rubs Wheeljack the wrong way. The two definitely don't see eye to eye. At the same time, Miko gets to become a full-blown 
Wrecker once she gets her hands on the Apex armor, absolutely destroying a couple Decepticons in awesome fashion. You do know that I vanquished Cliff Jumper, don't you? Big whoop. I snuffed Heart Shell. Later on, the season even brings forth one of the show's best episodes titled Thirst. It's here that Knockout and Starscream accidentally turn half the Decepticon troops into zombie vampire terror cons. It's a ton of fun and allows these two characters to have plenty of time to shine. If this is indeed the end, if we are to become Terracon Chow, it has been an honor serving Lord Megatron with you. You're no breakdown, though I must confess I have always admired your lustrous finish. At the same time, this episode even ties up some loose ends from the previous seasons, such as the return and subsequent death of Silas, as well as the return of Arachnid, who was ultimately sent to an abandoned moon of Cybertron with all of the Insecticons, where she will now infect them with the Terracon Plague. Ooh, spooky. But perhaps the most significant return in this episode is that of the synthetic Energon from Season 1, leading to the show's final stretch of episodes. In the season's ninth episode, it is revealed that the Predacon can transform, now calling himself Predaking, a reveal that gives Megatron some second thoughts about his whole Predacon cloning operation, given that they could so easily overthrow him. As such, the Decepticons orchestrate a scheme that sees the Autobots inadvertently destroy Project Predacon, which leads to a massive sequence where Ultra Magnus and Wheeljack face off against Predaking. And this fight is awesome. It's perhaps one of the best fights in the entire show. Ultra Magnus and Wheeljack just wailing on Predaking, and it even allows the two characters to find some common ground, which is nice. Uh, and here I was just beginning to tolerate you. It's been an honor serving beside you, soldier. But the destruction of Project Predacon had an unexpected side effect. The creation of raw cybermatter, which was caused by the combination of cybernucleic acid and synthetic energon. But while this particular event seems random and chaotic, Shockwave deduces that it's because of the unfinished and unstable synthetic energon formula. So, if the Decepticons manage to complete the synthetic energon, they can create a stabilized form of cybermatter, the substance that powered the Omega lock on Cybertron. As such, the Decepticons build a new Omega lock, and once they have the completed Cybermatter, they can finally restore Cybertron. As such, the Decepticons capture Ratchet, the only Autobot who managed to break through even a little on Synthetic Energon, coercing him into completing the formula, given his own desperation to see Cybertron restored. But in the end, Ratchet is still an Autobot, and while the Synthetic Energon formula is ultimately completed, stabilizing the Cybermatter, he sneaks behind the Decepticons' backs and reveals his location to the Autobots, leading to the final battle over the Omega Lock in the series finale titled Deadlock. A final battle that sees the Autobots use all of the tools at their disposal to gain control of the Omega Lock. I do not intend to squander a second chance to restore Cybertron. Even Jack, Miko, and Raph get some action, as Miko uses the Apex armor once again, and together they trap Soundwave between two ground bridges, tearing him into the Shadow Zone. Hey, that's the place the kids were stuck in from Season 1. It's a nice callback whilst also being a pretty clever way to take Soundwave off the board. But ultimately, the most useful tool for the Autobots is the Star Saber, which finally makes its return, as while Optimus is battling Megatron in one final stand, the sword is passed from Autobot to Autobot before winding up in Bumblebee's hands, who jumps to give the sword to Optimus all until... Is Bumblebee dead? I guess in a finale like this, there had to be some casualties, and the most unexpected choice is Bumblebee, who falls into the pool of cybermatter generated by the Omega Lock and vanishes completely. As such, after a brief fight, Megatron gets the upper hand over Optimus and wields his Dark Star Saber to destroy the Autobot leader once and for all. Megatron!
You took my voice. You will never rob anyone of anything ever again. Oh ho ho ho, let's go Bumblebee! With his swift action and surprising return, Megatron is finally vanquished left to plummet towards the Earth's surface, ending the war, leaving the surviving Decepticons Starscream and Shockwave no choice but to retreat. But how is Bumblebee alive? Well, the cybermatter pool he fell into managed to heal his wounds and even restore his voice. Gone are the bleeps and bloops. Bumblebee can now talk like the best of them. He's even got a mouth now. And with the Omega Lock under the Autobots' control, they waste no time unleashing its power on Cybertron's core, restoring their homeworld from within. Ah, uh, Cybertron is reborn. Though the war-ravaged cities will still need repairs, which mean the Autobots must say their goodbyes to Earth and return to Cybertron. This leaves us with a very emotional and heartfelt scene as the Autobots say goodbye to their human friends and by extension, the audience. Raph. I know, B. You don't need to say anything. I never did. As such, the Autobots embark to Cybertron, journeying to rebuild their homeworld, ushering in a new age of peace and happiness. And that is the end of Transformers Prime. Across its three seasons, Transformers Prime more than proved its worth to Transformers fans, not just appealing to the target audience of kids, but to older fans as well, giving them a slightly darker, more mature story. It's a series that captured the imaginations of so many old and new fans across its groundbreaking three season run. But that's not to say Transformers Prime is over for good, as there was a TV movie planned to release in October that would fully tie up all remaining loose ends like like the surviving Decepticons, and even Predaking. Until then, however, fans were satisfied enough with Prime's ending, and in the months after its conclusion, there was still plenty of Transformers news to chew on. From the grand opening of Transformers The Ride in Orlando, Florida, to the first ever Build-A-Bot fan poll that gave fans the ability to create an all-new Transformer. The poll ended up creating the female, sword-wielding Autobot flyer Windblade, who had the powers of telepathy. She would also get the spotlight in an all-new comic series for IDW. And of course, news hit a stride with the fourth live-action movie as production began in May 2013. Starting in Arizona, where the cast of vehicles was revealed, from unknown newcomers to familiar faces like an all-new Bumblebee and, of course, Optimus Prime. After that, the movie filmed in Central Texas, production taking place in and around the Austin area. After that, production moved north to Michigan, where new vehicles were revealed, including a new Bumblebee and a new semi-truck, immediately theorized rise to be Motormaster. And eventually, at the end of July, production focused in on Detroit for a massive battle that was supposed to be set in Hong Kong. With more daytime big city shooting, plenty of images and videos were able to get out from production. Of course, later on, production moved to Chicago, returning after Michael Bay's fantastic relationship with the city during Dark of the Moon. And it was also here that after weeks of speculation and rumors, the title for Transformers 4 was officially announced as... Transformers Age of Extinction, which also came with confirmation that the film would feature the one group of characters that fans have wanted to see on the big screen ever since the first movie, the Dinobots. Aw oh man, seeing Grimlock rampage city streets on the big screen just sounds awesome. It's a wonder they haven't done it yet. Eventually, production headed to China for the final stretch of shooting, filming in both Beijing and Hong Kong, cementing the massive co-production with the country. But as production in China continued winding down to the conclusion of principal photography, fans of Transformers Prime were finally able to return to TV screens as the feature-length series finale titled Predacons Rising aired on The Hub on October 4th. While the series had come to a satisfying end, it was now time to tie everything up in a nice, neat little bow. Over the course of its hour-long runtime, Predacons Rising ties up many of the remaining loose ends from Season 3. But because of Season 3's rather satisfying ending, this whole thing feels a little bit... unnecessary. 
Honestly, if you were just watching the show, you could stop once you finish season three. This really isn't essential viewing. But if you do decide to stick through and watch Predacons Rising, there are some things here that do stand out. From the introduction of two new Predacons, Skylinks and Darksteel, to the introduction of the Allspark, the mystical object that can imbue the restored Cybertron with new life. And of course, the entire premise of this finale revolves around the return of Unicron, who now inhabits the lifeless body of Megatron to awaken in an undead Predacon army to destroy Cybertron's core, and by extension, his mortal enemy, Primus. But as much as Unicron is a pretty sizable threat, the fact that he kind of brings Megatron back to life to inhabit his body feels weird. I mean, I really like the finality of Megatron's death. It seemed like a perfect way to end the show, so walking back on that is a little strange to me. Despite the rocky road, however, the final 15 minutes of Predacon's rising bring the heat. Not only does Knockout end up joining Team Prime, but the two new Predacons along with Preda King end up joining as well to face off against Unicron. And in a final battle between Optimus and Unicron, Optimus uses the empty container of the Allspark to trap Unicron's life force inside, severing the connection to his undead army, destroying them in the process. As such, Megatron is able to return to his body, and in a nice little turn of fate, he ends up disbanding the Decepticons entirely. Having endured torture himself, he feels no desire to inflict it upon others again, and flies away from everyone and everything. Though Starscream will still want to rejuvenate the Decepticons, until the Predacons get in his way, and they seemingly destroy him, so goodbye Starscream, I guess. But that leaves one important question. If Optimus was able to trap Unicron inside the Allspark container, what happened to the actual Allspark energy? Well, it turns out Optimus united the Allspark with the matrix of leadership inside of him, thus tying his own spark to the Allspark itself. Are you telling us that you are now one with the Allspark? <laughs> That's what you say when someone kicks the... Optimus must sacrifice himself to unite the Allspark with Cybertron's core to allow it to foster new life on the restored planet. Despite most of this finale seeming unnecessary, this is a solid conclusion, as Optimus journeys to the core, ending the show on a bittersweet note. For in my spark, I know that this is not the end. Simply put, another transformation. And with that, Transformers Prime comes to an end. For real this time. And with its conclusion, it joined Beast Wars and Animated as one of the single best entries to the franchise. From the impressive action to the good characters, while not perfect, it was a defining chapter for Transformers. A chapter that kind of came to an unofficial end. You see, the division that helped form the aligned continuity, HasLab, was shut down in 2012, which partly resulted in Prime's third season switching to focus on the Predacons. But from here, new shows would no longer really have to abide by the bind of Revelation, as it was called, the blueprint for this continuity, even if they were still set within the Aligned universe, like the still ongoing Rescue Bots cartoon. The Aligned continuity had already played things a little fast and loose, with each entry able to stand out with its own design inspirations. Aaron Archer even said that the continuity only really needed to pass a squint test. You know, it would all line up if you squinted. But now, things would get a lot looser. That being said, plenty of the ideas established by the Aligned continuity, namely origins and character personalities, would carry on from here. Which in a weird way did fulfill Hasbro's promise of a unified future, just not how they expected. But now, with Prime having come to a close and the toy line attached reaching the end of its life cycle, fans soon turned their eyes to the only Transformers project on the horizon, Age of Extinction. Though after production on the film wrapped in November 2013, news coming from the film became few and far between. That didn't mean there weren't occasional drops, such as an Entertainment Tonight set report and an Empire Magazine special, the cover of which featured the core human cast as well as the all-new Optimus Prime.
time. Coupled with that were a series of official photos from the five-month production over the summer, which, while neat, could only keep fans tied over for so long. Like, you showed the new Optimus, now let's see him in action. Unfortunately for fans, however, in order to see footage from the fourth installment, they'd have to wait until the clock turned to the year... After a myriad of toy leaks and tiny scraps of information, Transformers fans finally got something real from Transformers 4 during the Super Bowl, where, like the previous movies before it, Age of Extinction made its presence known with the first 30 seconds of official footage. While the CGI is certainly unfinished, the 30 seconds of footage on display are far from disappointing. Highlighting the new designs, big action, some new characters, maybe Megatron turns into a gun like in G1, and of course, the biggest reveal in the whole thing. Like, come on, dude. Optimus Prime riding Grimlock into battle? Whatever sequence that's a part of has to be good. While the overall response to this teaser was positive, there were some detractors. Like the new design for Optimus looking, well, different compared to what was in the first three movies. But Dinobots, they're finally bringing in the Dinobots. Even if the last two movies weren't well received, this one's gotta be different, cause it's got the Dinobots. But despite the exciting Super Bowl spot, fans were still clamoring for something bigger. 30 seconds can only do so much for so long. Thankfully for fans, a handful of new posters were revealed, including the best look yet at the all-new Optimus Prime, all of which led way to the March 4th debut of the teaser trailer. Introducing the new characters and world, this teaser goes a long way to set the stage for the action that is to come. But even with all of the new material, it also firmly connects this new movie to the ones before it. Look, it's not normal steel. I don't think it's a truck at all. I think we just found a transformer. On top of that, the teaser shows a glimpse of Optimus still sporting the design he had in the first three movies, as well as a glimpse of Ratchet being attacked by soldiers. Ooh, things aren't looking good for him. But most of this trailer, in true Michael Bay fashion, shows off teases of the big-scale action, promising that even with the new cast of humans and robots, Transformers can still blow stuff up like no other. And of course, right at the end, the teaser features an all-new look at the Dinobots. Even the title card looks different now. Ultimately, while this teaser didn't show a ton in regards to story, it still got fans excited about the Transformers' return to the big screen. Just fingers crossed the new cast and characters makes it better than the previous two. Let's hope for that. As excitement was building for Age of Extinction, Activision decided to capitalize on it, announcing their next Transformers game, Rise of the Dark Spark. Finally, there was a follow-up to Fall of Cybertron. Well, not really, because in perhaps the first instance of separation from the Aligned continuity, Rise of the Dark Spark would also tie directly into the upcoming movie. This was mainly due to the fact that the game was no longer developed by High Moon Studios. Following the financial disappointment of High Moon's Deadpool game in 2013, Activision massively downsized High Moon's staff. So instead, Rise of the Dark Spark was developed by Edge of Reality, who had done several ports of games before moving on to movie tie-ins like Shark Tale, Over the Hedge, and The Incredible Hulk. While the idea of following up on War and Fall of Cybertron was exciting, the disappointing news surrounding it held plenty of fans back from being truly excited for this next game. But hey, maybe Edge of Reality could surprise fans with their own approach to Transformers. But the video game was only a small part of promotion for the upcoming movie, which was still getting fans excited. As the spring months continued, drops of news filtered out, from theater standees to character posters confirming the names of the principal robots. Drift, Crosshairs, Hound, Lockdown, Stinger, the Dinobots Grimlock, Slug, Strafe, Scorn, and Slash, and perhaps most significantly, Galvatron, the revived form of Megatron. <laughs> 
This was followed up a few weeks later with the announcement of the voice cast, featuring plenty of returning voice actors from the first three movies, as well as newcomers John Goodman and Ken Watanabe. But perhaps most exciting to fans was that Galvatron was to be voiced by Frank Welker. Finally, Peter Cullen and Frank Welker were voicing their iconic leaders on the big screen. Only took seven years. And it's fitting as well, considering that Transformers was celebrating its 30th anniversary. 30 years since the first comic hit newsstands, since the first episode hit the airwaves. Man, things have come a long way. All of this excitement rose to a fever pitch, and after weeks of waiting and waiting for new footage from Age of Extinction, fans' patience was rewarded on May 16th with the release of the aptly titled Payoff Trailer. A rare metal, molecularly unstable, what they're made of. Across two and a half minutes, this trailer expands on plenty of the ideas shown in the previous trailers, all the while expanding to show off a metric ton of Bayhem. Action, explosions, excitement, could it be even bigger than the third movie? I don't know, but it looks pretty big. With some of the best looks yet at the new and returning characters, the big scale action, some transformations, the visual effects on display are completely on par with the previous movies. It looks pretty cool. With this trailer's release, the final marketing push towards the June 27th release began, as an onslaught of TV spots and posters were released in the remaining month and a half, to get fans more excited than ever before for the next Transformers installment. And on top of that, a viral marketing campaign began, with anti-Transformer propaganda videos released, specifically tackling the aftermath of the Battle of Chicago from Dark of the Moon, which was going to be a pivotal aspect to Age of Extinction. As the weeks continued into June, an excitement ramped up up the toy line hit store shelves, though the toys this time were far more simplified than they had been for the first three movies. This was an attempt by Hasbro to have their toys appeal to younger audiences who were perhaps unable to transform some of the biggest toys in the last few years. And of course, in true Michael Bay tradition, Age of Extinction was joined by an immense product tie-in blitz, perhaps even more products this time than in any of the previous movies, from brands like Big Red Soda, Duracell, Oreo, ESPN, Uber, and and of course, Chevy, which all got plenty of airtime in the lead up to the movie's release. The product tie ins even expanded beyond North America, with plenty of Chinese products featured as well, as part of the massive marketing blitz to capitalize on the production's partnership with the country. And in the days before Age of Extinction's debut, the video game tie in Transformers Rise of the Dark Spark was released to. Disappointing results. The loss of High Moon took its toll on this latest entry, unfortunately. Most of the game's assets are half-heartedly ripped straight from Fall of Cybertron, and in some cases, the Dark of the Moon video game. There also wasn't any competitive multiplayer side to the game either, meaning there wasn't much keeping fans interested after they finished the campaign. After Fall of Cybertron broke the mold for Transformers games in several ways, Rise of the Dark Spark merely retread the same ground, and in the most disappointing of circumstances, its release all but squashed the possibility of Fall of Cybertron getting a true sequel. While Rise of the Dark Spark did receive plenty of poor reviews from fans and critics alike, video game tie-ins were becoming exceedingly rare at this point, so it really wasn't a blemish on Age of Extinction's pop culture presence. Fans were still incredibly excited to return to theaters. Although more than any of the previous movies, there was a much larger portion of the audience who were outspoken about not being excited for this fourth entry, with plenty saying this will probably suck again. A sentiment that was unfortunately corroborated by early reviews, which once again slaughtered the movie with no remorse. All signs were pointing to a repeat of history, another critically panned Transformers movie that a lot of people would see. As audiences seemed to largely ignore the early negative press as they bought their tickets to see one of the most anticipated movies of the summer. Because after the slew of TV spots, toys, product tie-ins, and a massive world premiere in Hong Kong, June 27th arrived, where even with the negative reviews going in, the allure of the live-action debut of the Dinobots was enough to get butts into seats as audiences strapped in once again for more giant robot Bayham.
Oh, are we not doing the transforming title thing from the previous movies? You know, with the really cool sound design? No, no, oh, no, 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 I, all right, that's, that's cool, that's fine. Okay, mm-hmm. Age of Extinction picks up five years after the Battle of Chicago in Dark of the Moon, and it depicts a world in which the Transformers, Autobot, and Decepticon alike are outlawed on Earth. As such, Harold Attinger, the leader of a CIA black ops unit known as Cemetery Wind, you know, dead people farts, they're hunting down the remaining Transformers on Earth, aided by bounty hunter Lockdown and they seemingly destroy most of the Autobot survivors from the last movie, explicitly Leadfoot and Ratchet in pretty brutal fashion. It's a real bleak situation for the Autobots, but you know what's more bleak? The financial status of Cade Yeager, the main character in this movie played by Mark Wahlberg. Cade's in dire straits. His house is going to be foreclosed, he can't pay his employees, you're really supposed to feel for this down-on-his-luck guy. Except, unfortunately, you don't. Because he doesn't seem to care about paying his employees, he also doesn't seem to like anyone, nor does anyone really like him. So, by extension, the audience doesn't like him. And his relationship with his daughter Tessa is overprotective at best and borderline creepy at worst. He's just so protective of her. Not because of love, but more for ownership, which is really weird, dude. And it gets worse once her secret race car driving boyfriend Shane shows up. And the movie spends an undue amount of time spelling out the exact legal reasons why they are allowed to date. It is perhaps the most bizarre scene you could put in a movie of this scale. Statute 2705-3. What? Texas statute? Is that a real law? Yep. But Cade and his family end up getting worked into this larger Transformer plot when they discover the old rusted form of one Optimus Prime, who explodes onto the scene with perhaps his most iconic catchphrase. I'll kill you! Oh, don't shoot, don't shoot. oh yeah, that's right. This Optimus is a psycho. No, Optimus! He's gonna get along with Cade just fine. But with his introduction, Cemetery Wind knocks on Cade's door, leading to a massive chase where Optimus, as well as the Jaeger family, must escape from the evil military forces. And it ultimately results in the death of TJ Miller's character, Lucas, which is so sad, dude. It's such a sad death. Anyway, here's the all-new 2014 Lamborghini Aventador. Order now. After this, we get a scene where Optimus ends up reuniting with a couple other Autobots in a scene that is... Pretty neat. The whole transformation while driving into an all-new truck is cool, and the music brings it home. I mean, Steve Jablonski kills it like always. Now, in keeping with Optimus being a psycho, the Autobots he reunites with are also psychos. Crosshairs is an egotistical maniac who doesn't want anything to do with anyone else. Drift is a samurai with anger issues that are only really brought up when needed for a punchline. Bumblebee is a petulant child who cannot take any offense or else he turns into a literal baby. And Hound is so armed to the teeth with guns that he just wants to shoot anything and everything in his path. In fact, he probably enjoys killing things way more than he should. Just give me the word. I'll splatter him. Hey, it's honestly the perfect team for this Optimus, so... Autobots, I have sworn to never kill humans. Big mistake. But when I find out who's behind this, he's going to die. But it's with this reunion that the Autobots, along with Cade, Tessa, and Shane, must unravel the ultimate plot by the bad guys to avenge their fallen friends. So that leaves the question... What is the bad guy's plan in this movie? Well, it all starts with the creators, these mysterious beings who may very well be quintessons, though that's never confirmed in the movie. They, in fact, are the ones responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs, having dropped these bombs called seeds, detonating them across the surface, dispersing metal across the earth, killing everything in their path. And this metal is used to create the Transformers, or more specifically, it's used to create Optimus Prime, who, after the increased interaction between humans and Transformers on Earth, the creators want to reset the status quo. So they hire Bounty Hunter Lockdown to journey to Earth and capture Optimus Prime. Lockdown, in turn, teams up with Cemetery Wind, who go down the list of surviving Autobots all on their quest to locate Optimus. Cemetery Wind, of course, wants one of these seeds, and once they successfully capture Optimus, they trade their work for the seed. This seed, of course, is also used by Harold Attinger to trade with billion-dollar tech company KSI, or more specifically, the company's CEO Joshua Joyce, who's building his own transformation 
Transformers, who all transform in this weird new cube animation screensaver thing. Joshua Joyce wants the seed to create more of the metal, which the company has dubbed Transformium, to create an army of man-made Transformers. In turn, Harold Attinger will get a whole bunch of money and will be able to retire from the CIA. But Joshua Joyce's prototypes are not quite up to snuff, because while his main prototype is supposedly modeled after Optimus Prime, it keeps ending up looking like Megatron. Why is that? Well, you see, KSI have a few Decepticon heads that they're downloading for information, and one of them is Megatron. So Megatron is able to download his consciousness into the new body which the humans have called Galvatron. Now with this reawakening, Galvatron takes control of the other prototypes, including the Bumblebee clone Stinger, all in order to get the seed himself, so that he can create a new army of Decepticons and destroy all of humanity. You want to know the craziest part about all of that? I didn't make a single bit of it up. Although it is weird that Megatron, the ruthless warlord he is, would end up taking on the name the humans gave him. And on top of that, while he's taking over the other drones, he says perhaps the funniest line of the whole movie. My brothers, today I grant you your freedom. And from now on, you are commanded by me. I think the irony is a little lost on him on that one. Now, if you got lost at any point during the ultimate bad guy plan stuff, don't worry. It can all be boiled down to this. Everyone wants the seed. Which leads to the conflict journeying to Hong Kong, where the movie trades in its barrage of American flags and outlandish Bud Light product placement to instead shill Chinese products for the last third of the movie. It also has a little bit of pro-government propaganda, showing that the Chinese government will always be there to help Hong Kong and its citizens, which is only a little bit ironic. Now, this final battle sees the Autobots facing Galvatron and his Decepticons, as well as Lockdown all in pursuit of the Seed, which is carried by Joshua Joyce, who finally clued in that his invention was gonna kill people. But only after a stern talking to from Cade Yeager, which contains the other funniest line in the movie. Look, I know you have a conscience because you're an inventor like me. But there's one thing that's still missing from all of this, but I can't quite put my finger on what it is. Oh yeah, right, the Dinobots are supposed to be in this. Where the hell are they? Well, after a whopping two hours and ten minutes, it's revealed that the other knights that Lockdown captured to return to the creators are the Dinobots. As such, Optimus coerces them to join the Autobots in their fight. How does he coerce them, you ask? Well... You defend my family. Or die. He threatens their lives, of course. I mean, for all this talk of not wanting to be enslaved or killed by humanity, he sure doesn't have any qualms when it comes to enslaving or killing others. Now that's Optimus Prime. This leads to the centerpiece of the third act, the Dinobot Charge, which, considering it's the primary reason people bought tickets for this movie, it is actually a pretty neat scene. I mean, it delivers what was promised, even if there's not nearly enough of it. In fact, there are some highlights in the action. This sequence and the following sequence with the magnet are particularly particularly strong pieces of action filmmaking. I mean, there's just so much happening all over the screen. It's so dense, every single image has so many things going on. Despite that, there's nothing really in this movie that quite lives up to the spectacle of the first three. The visual effects don't have quite the same polish. It's clear that ILM was stretched thin this time around. And on top of that, the sound design doesn't feel quite as creative. And worse yet, there are times where it feels unfinished, like there should be sounds where there aren't any. But ultimately, it all leads to a final battle between Optimus Prime and Lockdown, which is also joined by Bumblebee as well as Cade Yeager and Harold Attinger, which leads to the moment where Optimus fulfills his promise from earlier and murders Harold Attinger. You want to know the worst part about Optimus being a psycho? It's that he can't see a doctor anymore because Ratchet's dead. Cemetery Wind and their consequences have been disastrous to mankind. Eventually, all leads to the moment where Optimus gets the drop on Lockdown, impaling him with his sword and slicing his head open. Man, the dude's just got a revel in it, huh? Honor 
to the end. There was nothing honorable about what you just did, but okay. But with Harold and Lockdown's brutal deaths, the conflict has been resolved. Once again, no one has learned a thing, and the movie ends in spectacularly quick fashion, where the Dinobots rush off into the sunset, probably never to be seen again. Oh, and Galvatron walks off too. That's right. I forgot about him. And Optimus takes the seed and blasts into space, promising in his final narration to find his creators and presumably murder them. I am Optimus Prime, and this message is to my creators. Leave planet Earth alone, because I'm coming for you. Wow. That one was... that one was bad. It wasn't good. And Critical Response certainly agreed with that assessment, with plenty of negative reviews coming out. And it was perhaps an even louder negative buzz than for the previous movies, with plenty more people talking about the insane sequences, jokes, and Bud Light product placement. Although the box office for the movie still held strong, with it garnering a significant $245 million domestically and a whopping $1.1 billion dollars worldwide, thanks in large part to the cooperation with China. There was some solace for critics, though. Despite the movie raking in a massive $245 million domestic haul, it was a significant decrease from Dark of the Moon's $352 million. Perhaps it was a sign that American audiences were getting sick of the franchise, considering that the quality of the films showed no signs of improving. Despite that, the live-action franchise was still full steam ahead, as plans were set in motion for Transformers 5 to release in 2016. Though this time, for real, Michael Bay was not going to direct, instead handing off the reins to someone new. Yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. All in all, Age of Extinction proved to be one of the worst received entries in the franchise, rivaling Revenge of the Fallen and even Transformers Energon. Now that's a low bar. All of this made one thing perfectly clear. The golden age of Transformers was over. The film franchise had cemented itself as Hollywood's punching bag, the aligned continuity had been downsized significantly, and Rise of the Dark Spark brought the Cybertron games to an underwhelming end. Fans had greatly enjoyed the last few years of the brand, and it would become a source of plenty of nostalgia in the following years. But for now, Transformers fans were left to wait, eager to see when Transformers would return to its true glory. The Transformers will return after these messages.